Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Secretary, you lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, go ahead and call the roll. Ruth Griffey? Here. Douglas Knight? Here. here. Matthew Nelson? Here. David Reinecker? Here. Richard Sterner? Here. Corey Trosel? Here. Michael Wool? Here. Jennifer Zerfing? Here. Yep. John Fox? Here. Here. Shane Hotchkiss? Here. Justin Peart? Here. All right. I'd like to welcome all of our guests to the meeting this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, our first order of business is to approve the resignation of David Lockhart as school board member. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion, unless I hear and they are abstained. Okay, next item, item six, uh, board candidate interviews. Uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Hotchkiss. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those viewing remotely, we have um, 10 candidates for the vacant board seat uh, present with us today. And we do have one candidate that will be participating via Zoom. Um, each, we've asked each candidate to identify themselves prior to answering um, any of the questions. And um, we will uh, ask a series of questions, member, and I will do that. Members of the school board can ask follow-up questions or additional questions at the end of um, the interviews here today. Um, each candidate will have uh, three minutes to open the, uh, answer the opening question and two minutes to answer each of the follow-up questions. So we are going to go ahead and begin. And we're going to start off with um, Mr. Brian Davis. So for all candidates, um, we're gonna ask each of you to provide us with a brief introductory statement. And then in that statement, please share with us why you're interested in serving on the school board of the Bermudian Springs School District. For those in the audience, we are just double checking the camera so that you have the ability to see uh, the candidates who are talking. Ready? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Davis, Latimer Township resident, uh, 2010 graduate of Bermudian Springs High School, a 2013 Penn State graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree in Agribusiness Management and Horticulture. Uh, I've been a resident of the district my entire life. Uh, as of last year, I am the new owner of uh, what was Wiser Orchards on Town Hill Road just outside of York Springs. Uh, I'm extremely proud to be a resident of, of the district and, and be a, a fruit grower in the community. and. Uh, I would very much like to serve as a member of this board to make sure that the students of the district have the highest quality education that they can receive while looking out for our, our community and, and our residents and, and make sure that their best interests are kept in mind. Is there another question? Or that's it? <laughs> that, that, we're gonna do one question at a time, okay, so thank thanks. you. Charles, Mr. Farley. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Charles Michael Farley. I go by Mike, um, gone by my middle name. 
Um, I currently live on Lake Mead Road. Basically, just I think this will be a great opportunity to serve on this board where I live, so I can try to do something in the community where I actually live in now. And I can't think of a better opportunity than serving on the school board. Um, I guess I forgot. I am also a, a former teacher. I used to teach uh, in Florida, and I used to be a substitute teacher in Maryland. I uh, taught special ed in Florida for one year on a special assignment, not long after college. Uh, I've been working at the Dublin Library as the team manager for about 12 years now. That's all I have. Thank you. Next candidate, uh, Mary Kemper. Hi, my name is Mary Kemper. I'm a Latimer resident. I graduated from Bermuda and Springs in 1995, graduated from Lebanon Valley College with a Bachelor of Science in Biology in 1999. And in 2001, graduated from Chatham University with a master's of physician assistant studies. Um, I've been part of the Bermudian Springs School District my whole life. I have an up and coming ninth grader and 11th grader. I have um, been a physician assistant in pediatrics 19 years at Hanover Pediatric Associates. I've helped coach youth softball, youth field hockey, served on the as vice president for the Bermudian Youth Football League. Um, think I can benefit from being on the board as just being part of the school district for such a long time, be a voice for the, the youth as well as the parents and just the community in general. We could hear her. I apologize to the audience. The uh, mute button uh, malfunctions. So we're going to have uh, Mary answer the question once again, once we get the volume rectified. Hi, my name is Mary Kemper. I am a 1995 graduate from Bermuda Springs. I have a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Lebanon Valley College and a 2001 graduated with a Master's of Physician Assistant Studies from Chatham University in Pittsburgh. I've been part of the Bermuda Springs School District my whole life, as well as my family, um, my parents, well, my dad. And then um, I've been a physician assistant at Hanover Pediatric Associates for 19 years. I have been a coach for youth softball, youth field hockey, and also served vice president of the youth football program at Bermudian. Um, wanted to be part of the board just because uh, I've been part of the school district my whole life and to give the, a voice to the children as well as the parents and the community in general. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Amanda Lee Milner. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Lee Milner and I follow a similar history as Ms. Kemper <laughs> as I am a 1995 graduate of Bermudian Springs a 1999 graduate of Lebanon Valley College where I uh, majored in English with a communications concentration and then graduated in 1999 from the University of Georgia with a master's degree in public um, relations and mass communications. When I left the University of Georgia, I ended up pursuing a career in public service through the state government. I had a variety of 
uh, positions within the state government uh, where I was exposed to public administrative roles in the uh, areas of human resources, procurement, budget, collective bargaining, and a variety of other things. In addition, when I finished my career, uh, with my 12 year career with the Commonwealth and retired, um, I finished in the governor's budget office where I was responsible for overseeing a $38.2 billion budget for four state agencies. And I understand that that sounds like a big number um, compared to the school district's number, but the thing that I have learned through my experience in public administration is that while that number is still big, there are a lot of fixed costs within that budget, just like you have pension and salaries and a variety of other things, physical plant uh, responsibilities. There's very little wiggle room for discretionary spending. Um, but that brings me to where I am now, which is a farmer. I took over ownership of my family farm when I moved back to the district in 2014 with my family. I have two elementary school age children. I am involved with the PTO at the elementary school where I oversee a committee that focuses on appreciation activities for the staff, the teachers and the bus drivers. And I feel like one of the responsibilities of the school board is to provide a excellent uh, public education for our students. And to do that, you need to um, have a diverse board. Uh, and I feel like I bring that diversity by being a parent and by having um, public administration background as well as being a long-term resident here in the district. Thank you. Uh, Jordan Lair. Hi, I'm Jordan Lair. I'm actually a resident here at Bermudian here. I've been in the school district uh, and this area all my life. I actually sat on the board at one point in time and then I moved residents outside of my area and everything and I had uh, threatened you guys I might be back someday. But anyway, I wanted to, you know, I had two sons they both came up through the district uh, my wife worked here at the district and you know I've always been involved with the community I've been involved with the in and out of social events around the community I've helped through building projects I've uh, sat through some of those my background is in building residential and commercial building projects I have done that and now I'm the owner of five different companies at this point. We run anything from, you know, mold remediations the whole way to water restoration. So I get through any types of uh, leads, asbestos and everything else. I'm certified in all those. So of all the years that we've sat here and we went through the different projects, you know, I sit and I look for the students. I look out for the interests of our students. I look out for the interests of our staff and our teachers and everybody on the board trying to make good solid decisions of for the financial growth of the company to stick there. And that's it. Thank you. Next candidate is Melissa Perro. Short. <laughs> um, hi, my name is uh, Melissa Ann Perro. Um, I uh, have a bachelor's degree from Lebanon Valley College, uh, graduate 1998. I have a master's uh, in English education. I have a master's degree in English education from Shippensburg University from 2002. I'm currently working on a uh, doctorate in curriculum and instruction from Liberty University as well. Um, I had the opportunity in 2001 to start here at Bermudian Springs as a high school English teacher. And I spent the last uh, 19 and a half years uh, here at Bermudian uh, teaching 11th and 12th grade seniors. I was a student council advisor, class advisor. Um, I started the LGBTQ um, safe club uh, our, our, uh, the high school's GSA. Uh, in December, I left Bermudian Springs um, to make a career shift. So I now work for Lincoln Intermediate Unit uh, as a staff developer. So I went from teaching students to teaching uh, teachers. Uh, and um, I've had the opportunity in the last six months or so to work with a lot of uh, teachers, both here and in districts in all three of our counties uh, to help uh, the adjustment to district, uh, to distance learning 
hybrid learning. Um, and I was part of the IEL uh, Learn On website uh, team. So uh, my, I have two children here in the district. I have a, a middle schooler and an elementary schooler. My stepson graduated here uh, in 2013, uh, he graduated. Uh, I moved to the district in 2008. Um, I came here uh, as someone from New Jersey who didn't really know the area and grew to love um, this, this place. Um, the community embraced me as a teacher, uh, as a teacher of their students, of their children. And uh, when I moved here, they embraced me as a parent in the area. I would love, um, I had the opportunity to be a part of this district as a teacher for 19 and a half years uh, and grow to love the teachers, faculty, staff, bus drivers uh, here in the area. Uh, and now that I'm not in the district as an employee, I would love the opportunity to come back uh, and fill my voice uh, to help the community and the students to make sure that we give everybody uh, the best education they possibly can. Uh, my heart and soul is in this district. It's been since the day I started here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next candidate is Ed Prosser. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Prosser. I'm a 1970 graduate of Bermuda Springs High School. Uh, whenever I started in first grade, it was actually York Springs School District. Uh, and about third grade is when East Berlin and York Springs came together. Uh, to become Bermuda and Springs School District. Uh, I live in Latimer Township. Uh, in 1979, we moved to Elizabethtown and we lived there for 39 years. And I moved back to my homestead in Mountain Road about three years ago. Uh, I think today's students to become responsible members of society need excellent instruction and training by highly trained teachers and staff. Uh, and I think this needs to be done in a financially responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you. Next candidate, uh, Christian Snyder. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Christian Snyder, I'm here for the same position everybody else. And uh, kudos to Mary for going a second time. Good for you. <laughs> stuff. But anyway, uh, I, I, I graduated and grew up in an area, Lime Mountain High School, which is in Northumberland County. And just like this school, it's about the same size, 500 students. We were the Eagles as well. Uh, I went on to uh, attend college, also at Lebanon Valley College. Seems like we have a lot of representatives from LVC, which is great. So, uh, good. That's awesome. Um, I just received a bachelor's degree in biochemistry there. And then I attended Temple School of Podiatry, where I got my medical training in foot and ankle surgery. I then went to uh, Long Island, New York, where I was very fortunate to serve under the Veterans Administration, where I got my surgical training um, at the VA, which I was there for two years, and then extended up to a year at Ankle, Foot and Ankle Fellowship and Trauma up in upstate New York in Kingston, and I got the benefit of living in Woodstock, New York for one year. Uh, so that was a good experience. I wanted to come back to Pennsylvania uh, as training between New York uh, because I just love the state. And uh, I like the small settings, the size of the school. The community reminded me of my same uh, area that I grew up. I sent out a lot of applications around Pennsylvania, all from Reading to Berwick, all the way down into Maryland. And I chose Hanover to set up my practice. I was fortunate to join a partnership there, and we have a very good, successful business. I'm on full surgical privileges at Hanover Hospital, which I hand with uh, diabetic and uh, foot and ankle trauma. Then I'm on staff now since 2000, since I joined to the area. I'm in the same location, same practice. And I also take care of three nursing home uh, in places right now with care of patients. We have busy practice and I had the opportunity of choosing the school district I wanted to go into. I looked at a lot of the areas I first lived in Lake Mead, which was also Lattimore Township for a few years when my two boys, <coughs> excuse me, they uh, were about two and four. We saw some land up in Gardner's and bid up here and I love the apple orchards and love the area, but I really choose to stay in the school district. I think it's a great school. I think you guys have done numerous years budging your money very well, providing what you can for education for the kids. Uh, and I think that's great. My biggest uh, contribution I think is the last few years and not just surgically and for my patients, but is also taking care 
um, being participation, a lot of volunteer. I've uh, joined the Boy Scout troop and I've been assistant scout master and I take care of a lot of the outdoor activities, high adventure with Troop 88, which is in Lake Mead. And I've also been a soccer coach and served on the board, uh, the coach admin for several years, uh, approximately about, yes. Okay, 30 seconds. So my thing is the assets of this community is the, st the students. I think it's important for the kids to get a good education, foundation, sports, but also just getting along and being with our friends and kids. And I think it's a balancing act that we can do here, but I wanted to contribute to serve on the board. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Next candidate is Matt Wolf. Um, hello, Matthew Wolf. Um, before I get started on uh, my introduction, I did want to take the time and just say my thoughts and prayers are with the Lois family. Um, if anything comes out of it, this is, that's, that was important to me. Um, moving forward, uh, my name is Matthew Wolf. I've been a Lattimore Township resident my entire life. I am a 2011 graduate of Bermudian Springs, a 2015 graduate of Penn State with an energy engineering major and uh, bachelor, or bachelor of science in energy engineering with a dual minor in environmental engineering and energy business and finance. Um, I'm currently employed with Metso Auto Tech. Um, I do bid packages, uh, so proposals, estimates, sales of multi-million dollar pyro processing systems. Um, successfully sold an $84 million lithium spodumene processing plant in Australia, a $32 million plant in, Ru in Russia, excuse me. Um, why I'm here? Um, two main reasons. Um, I think I offer a unique perspective uh, to something that the board hasn't had before. Um, not many candidates or members can say they've graduated Bermudian within the last 10 years. Um, from Bermudian then, I've gone on to Penn State and also worked in a trade with Keith D. Smith. I worked uh, as a concrete laborer between the summers of my schooling. Um, it's something that's, that's unique in that I know where the students have been. I know what they need to do. I know uh, the struggles, um, the positive and negatives that they came out with the education from Bermudian. Um, I think that's unique and it speaks for itself of what I could offer. Um, the, other, the other main reason is the impact that the decisions by this board have on my life and those surrounding me. Um, my mother's an employee here. My father-in-law is an employee here. Um, a lot of my friends and family, uh, their parents work here or their spouse works here. Um, and then also the impact that my son will go here. He will attend the new middle school that's being built. Um, my nieces and nephews will go here uh, as we are currently working on a, a building project on Cran off of Cranberry Road on Farm View. Um, and hopefully my grandchildren will grow here. Uh, that's, that's why I'm here. I want to give them the opportunity uh, that I was given, if not a better one. I want to give their friends a better opportunity. Um, that's, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Next candidate, uh, Dan Worley. Hi, I'm Dan Worley. I'm also, like two other candidates, a 1995 graduate of Bermudian Springs. I, uh, I then uh, attended Gettysburg College. I graduated there in 1999 with a uh, major in history and a minor in political science. And then I wanted to follow my grandfather's footsteps, so I went to law school and uh, went to Dickinson. I uh, graduated there in was it, 2002. And uh, then I walked out of there with my JD and I was like, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> so. I uh, kind of uh, went to practice with my grandfather and I kind of fell into what's called juvenile dependency work. Um, and, and I loved it. Uh, juvenile dependency is when children are removed from their parents for one reason or for another, for neglect, abuse, um, the court appoints someone to, to watch out after those children, to look out for the best interests uh, across the board. And, and that's what I've been doing for the past, it's going on 18 years now. I've represented thousands of kids. And um, in that position, I have seen what happens when kids don't have a good education, when they don't go to school, when they're truant. And I have pretty much made it my, my job to try to get as many kids to school, to get them educated, 
um, as I possibly can. I have served on all sorts of groups. I have been um, in the uh, truancy task force in York County. Um, I have served on, um, uh, I've presented at national um, committees uh, as child welfare. I was on the um, uh, Pennsylvania uh, Board of uh, uh, Child Welfare um, throughout the Pennsylvania State Roundtable. I served with Supreme Court justices, uh, lawyers, judges across the state. I had, uh, I list, a lot of times I am uh, also put as educational advocate, educational decision maker for these children. So I've uh, attended my share of IEP meetings across the state. Uh, so my, I got this note in the mail saying we need somebody on the school board. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's, that's in my wheelhouse. I represent kids. I represent kids across the state, mostly in York County. And why can't I take these skills that I've acquired, bring them home to where I live, to you know, where I graduated from, and to help, help other kids? And that's really what I've been doing. Um, I have, you know, I'm a lifelong Latimer Township resident. I moved a grand total of maybe a mile away from where I grew up. Um, I have two kids that attend a district, um, Isaac and Ruth, going into uh, third and fourth grade. Love, love the school. I have worked with schools across this, across the state, and I always speak highly of Bermudian Springs. It's a good school. So if you appoint me or not, I'm still going to talk good about Bermudian Springs because it is a great district. So that's why I'm here. I'm just here to offer my services, whatever they may be, and uh, we'll see. All right, thanks. Thank you. And our final candidate, Darren Yauker. Hi, uh, first, uh, Darren Euchre, I uh, live in East Berlin. want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate remotely. I work in Camp Hill, and I knew that I was not going to be able to get there in person, which I would prefer to be. Second, I'd love to say it is fantastic to see a school board seat get this level of interest. And that certainly says that there is an engaged community out there that wants to make the district better. I serve as a director of state government affairs for Pennsylvania Farm Bureau. So I have a, an intimate understanding of how state government works and how they sometimes impose things on local government and school districts. Uh, my family and I moved to the school district four years ago and I set a goal for myself that I wanted to get more community engaged. I currently serve as the chair of our boroughs, parks and recreation committee, uh, but I have three kids in the school district, uh, one, in, one in every building. So I have a vested interest in wanting to make sure that uh, there is a quality education for them and for the students that are gonna be coming up behind them. Uh, so that's where my interest lies, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say it is just tremendous to see this level of enthusiasm for uh, a school board position uh, and it seems like the district is going to be well served no matter the candidate that's chosen. Thank you. Now we'll go to the second question for everybody and we'll start again with Mr. Davis. And this time, uh, candidates, I'll just have you identify yourself since we have the, the flow. The next question for each of you, what do you feel is the proper role for a school board member and the operations of the schools in our district? Brian Davis, uh, the role of a school board member is to, to faithfully attend meetings and, and be an active part of, of the board and, and their proceedings and to look out for uh, the, the education of our students, make sure that they are, are learning and, and being taught to the highest standards and our board members need to to be active in the community and and know what's going on in the community and look out for their neighbors and the best interests of 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 property owners and and residents of the district can you remind me the second part of the question yeah, it's uh, what do you feel is the proper role for school board member in the operations of our schools? Oh, the, the operations of the school. Yeah, uh, I, I'm again extremely proud to be a to have been a Bermudian graduate. I, I'm I think that I received a very high quality education, 
And I think that, that our board in past years has done an extremely good job of, of budgeting and, and making the right decisions for the district. And uh, secondly, agricultural representation on the board is important to me. And uh, that's, that's a role that I wanna fill in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Okay, uh, Mike uh, Farley, Charles Michael Farley. Um, answer that question, I guess, just simply, it's just to look out for the, um, the uh, welfare of the students and as well as the community itself. Um, it's kind of a simple answer to that. I'm not gonna go into anything else, that's, that's what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Kemper, um, to be actively involved with the school board to make the best decisions for the children of the district with taking in consideration um, the community, the parents, also the, the school employees, the teachers, and the administrators, and um, looking at it from all perspectives, financially, educationally, mental health-wise for the kids, which is often overlooked, um, and making sure it all inter interacts with like the community of the area. Thank you. Amanda Lee Milner. The responsibility of a school board member is to first uphold the needs of the students and provide them with the quality education that they deserve, which is the first part of the procedures manual of the school board. So one is to make sure that those kids are getting an education, that we are identifying areas. We have a unique opportunity because we have a large industry or a large agricultural um, component to our school district. We can target agriculture. We can find other areas, possibly you know, computer programming that could get kids into colleges and competitive fields. But our number one job is to figure out what those students need in order to be successful citizens in this community. The second thing we are responsible for is the teachers and the staff who work here. Without quality staff, without quality teachers, we do not have a quality education for our children. And that means competitive salaries, that means policies that support them here at the district and taking their opinions and their, um, their experience with the kids and, and making that a centerpiece. Third um, is our administration. Without our principals, without our superintendents, the teachers don't have the guidance that they need and the direction for the, the, um, for the school district as a whole. And finally, we have a fiscal Responsibility to the taxpayers who are responsible for over half of the budget for the school district. We have a, a responsibility to be transparent, but also responsible with those funds. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan Lair. Um, our responsibilities of sitting on the board um, cover an array of options a lot of times that we have to look at. Um, we have to sort of balance everything that comes back from the administrators, principals, staff, most of all students. We need to really listen to what they're saying out there and what they're seeing. We have to give the support and everything behind your administrators are out there that are listening to the teachers, the staff and everything, bringing everything to the board, letting it in front of us to see once what we can see, look at the options. And then it's our job sitting there is to try to find the answers, how to come up with that the remedy of the problems that they're facing out there. You know, the financial advisors here and everybody else that sits in here is we have to look at the finances. We have to see what we can spend the money on, where we can get it from, and how hard can we push to find more money out in the communities. You know, we need to balance everything to bring it back. So everything that weighs on the shoulders of you guys up here is looking out for those students and the residents of our community you know, because a lot of the burden comes back on them guys. So we, 
we got to continually balance everything that comes up and continually listen to what the students need, the staff needs and teachers and administrators to try to put that forth and then come up with a good balanced budget at the end to be able to serve everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Melissa Ampiro. Um, I feel that the, the role of the board is the voice of our community. Uh, we are the parents um, and uh, homeowners of the area and we're the voice of um, our, our constituency, of the, of the people in our community. Um, and our job, um, the job of the school board is to make sure that um, the choices that we make um, are both fiscally um, important and, and work well with our community, but also uh, fit the educational needs of our students. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, work through this system um, as a teacher here and know uh, how uh, the money gets spent for uh, teacher um, um, education and, and professional development and the one-to-one, uh, -one, the one-to-one -one initiative that helped our students move from uh, one point to the next in, uh, in a global world. And the school board was a major part of that and must continue to be in order to make sure that we continue the uh, educational pedagogy advances of both the teachers and students in the district um, and, you know, and speak to our community. So, thank you. Thank you. Ed Prosser, uh, I think as a school board member, we should uh, attend meetings, look at the information we've be, been given and make rational decisions on the information to support the administration, teachers, staff, and students. Uh, and taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Christian Snyder. Uh, for that question, I think as the board, of course, we're fiscally responsible for budgeting, uh, which is uh, always be said um, for keeping a balance. We have to be competitive, getting good teachers here. The one thing I've always been impressed with with this school district, my two boys being now a freshman, uh, entering his freshman year and a junior, I think the teachers have been great here. I've been very impressed with their um, commitment to the students, their educational purposes, um, commitment even after hours, making sure they're uh, getting the, the, what they need. And I think one of the hardest thing was shifting kids away from home, um, sitting in front of a computer screen and here, talking to the teachers I had the benefit of talking also to teachers that are patients of mine in the Hanover area of six different school districts. And uh, they were really sad. They really missed their kids um, interacting, seeing their faces, um, seeing how they grow. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure those teachers can have that connection with the kids, whether it be a hybrid model or whatever it is, to be that connection, have the kids grow. Because I think if you can't see their expressions, can't see them how they're motivated, we're missing that. But I also think it's about the kids. At the end of the day, we uh, should hear from uh, the parents in our community how their kids are growing, um, opening up both academics, but also vocational training and all these opportunities that they have, leadership, sports, academics, uh, and just having confidence and growth. Um, I just don't see kids st st looking into a small funnel. We need to get these kids um, back into some level. And I think it's so important for the school board to balance it out with what our duties are financially, but also to make sure the kids have what they need and let the teachers just step back and let the teachers do their magic. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Wolf, um, I think the, the big responsibility of the school board, the, the most important is to serve the community. Um, how do you serve the community? You provide a quality education and a healthy and safe learning environment for the youth of the community. Um, that's 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 the main reason you know schools are here. We're, we're providing our youth with the opportunities to to go out into the world and and discover you know what they want to do. Um, that's that's the main purpose. Um, the the branches of that can get intertwined though. You want to provide opportunity job opportunities for the community. You want to pro provide extracurriculars for the students, whether that be the arts, the sports. Um, it gets intertwined. Um, these are these are not easy decisions that a school board member must make. Um, you, you have to take into account that you're making decisions for not just yourself, not just your kids, not just 
you know, your parents, you're, you're making a decision for everyone. Um, so it, it gets it gets intertwined. Um, like everyone else has basically hit on, it needs to be financially sound. Um, you need to provide the opportunities for the teachers to to create LBGTQ opportunities within the classrooms, things like that. Um, the the school board member is is the problem solve the best way to serve the community. That's 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 what I would take it as. Thank you. Hello, Dan Worley. I think for school boards and many boards, probably the best thing a school board member or a board member can do is listen. Listen to their, their constituents, listen to the public, listen to the students, listen to the administration, listen to the teachers, and then have a tough skin because uh, not everybody's going to agree with you. And there's going to be people are polarized on one side, people are polarized on the other side. And your job is to be almost a mediator, almost an arbitrator, and to sit down there and make those tough decisions. Try to decide, you know, what is going to benefit my kids, the kids, the community, because um, we have to be fiscally responsible. There's no doubt about that. It's taxes are a burden on all of us, but we are also, also it, what, what we're doing is so important. These are kids, these are our future. And we can't afford to, to skimp on our future because at some point we're gonna be old, we're gonna be maybe in a nursing home or whatever, and we're gonna rely on this future generation to help take care of us, to be there for us. So we need to be there for them now. And I think that's, the, that's what a board needs to do. They need to realize that they need to keep that in their line of sight, that uh, we are working for something bigger than, than what we are at this point. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Euchre, it's your turn. Thank you. I, I think the biggest role of a school board member is to be the voice of the communities that they serve. Uh, and that means, uh, as other candidates have said, being a very active listener and a very active participant. Uh, the professionals that do the day-to-day -day job are hired for a reason because they have that area of expertise. We then need to bring the community's interest, uh, be it fiscal responsibility, being it creating a great school environment, uh, a great environment that attracts top-notch te top teachers. Uh, but our goal is to listen, to be an arbiter, and to ask questions of our professionals, again, just to... to to merge those two needs of an excellent education with fiscal responsibility and trusting the professionals that are in place to then execute uh, that, that will and that vision. Thank you. We'll now move on to the third question for all candidates. Third question is, what do you think the Bermudian Springs School District does well? And then what can we approve upon? Brian Davis. I believe that the Bermudian Springs School District does an exceptional job at providing opportunities for our students, uh, be it education in the classroom or extracurriculars, sports, arts, um, job opportunities uh, after high school. Not, I, I firmly believe that not every student is meant to go to college, and, and I think that our school is doing a tremendous job at uh, of reaching out into the, to the community to, to trade schools, trade jobs, and, and getting our students into the workforce. Uh, what could the school district do better is a, is a tough question to think of off the top of my head. Um, I think there, there can always be better uh, communication between um, the school and, and residents, uh, there, there's, and, and that responsibility falls on the residents too. There, there's a, unfortunately, there's a lot of residents that, that are uninformed. They don't know what's going on. And um, that's another important job of the board members is, is to, to talk to their neighbors and, and ensure that, that our, our uh, members of the community know what's going on in the district uh, so that, that we can do an even better job of, of educating students and, and keeping the community informed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, Mike Farley again. Um, 
guess for the first part, as far as what it, the school district does well, um, I've only lived here for a couple of years, but uh, my niece goes here, she's in the middle school and all here from my brother and brother-in-law are great things. So, um, and as far as what needs to be improved on, I don't really know as of right now, because um, I'm not that familiar with everything that's going on. But I do know from my experience um, going to school board meetings where I work at as the, the teen librarian that um, I could see a lot of school board members kind of seem to live in a bubble when it comes to what the kids go through out on a daily basis. Because I've seen the worst of the worst that a lot of kids confide in me in a lot of things. Um, so that is something that I do notice. I'm not talking about anybody in particular here because I don't know anybody here. I'm just saying these are some things that I noticed that needs to be addressed as far as school boards. So. Thank you. Mary Kemper, um, I think Bermudian Springs School District provides a great education, um, great diverse of teachers. I think it's provided uh, diverse extracurricular activities and has done a great job at getting students prepared for either college, trade schools, or just the general workforce. Um, the tech prep, I think, is a nice addition for many students. Um, what it needs to work on the, more, the most, I would say, is more interaction with the community or at least getting more involved. Um, maybe also more in closer interaction with some of the parents because some of the parents don't fully understand things that are going on. Um, I mean, and that's from their perspective as well, keeping involved from both sides, um, but just keeping everybody closely interlinked for the benefit of the students. Thank you. Amanda Lee Milner. I'm going to speak from my experience with my elementary school children and nephews. And that is that Bermudian has done a really great job at the academics. My kids can write, they can read, they can do math. But what they do and go above and beyond is try to teach them how to be good human beings. So this last year under Mrs. Myers and Mrs. Ely and uh, Mr. Sense, they have been working on kindness. So the whole year has been focused on kindness activities. And when they come home, when we ask them the three, we ask them a couple of probing questions, but then we say, how, how have you been kind today? What did you do to be kind? What did somebody do to be kind to you? And that goes beyond what the academics are. And that is what makes the district a good district because they're looking beyond whether the kids' test scores are good or what their benchmarks are, but how are they being good people? And, the year, and they, they also work on the SOAR model, which is a nice behavior modification um, program. And I've just been really impressed by those additional um, assets to my kids' education. And what can the school district improve on? We have almost 10% of our students and, uh, that are Hispanic. And one of the things that our district can do because we have the community here is embrace the Hispanic community. We can embrace language at younger levels. My children would love to learn Spanish. Uh, we can do integrated classrooms. And I know that that will take up a small piece of the budget, the small discretionary funding. But one of the things I really think that we can benefit from, especially since Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world with English being the third, is to embrace that community and start when the kids are younger, when they actually learn languages better and then be able to have more integrated classrooms. Thank you. Jordan Lair. Um, what do I think we do for meeting does well? I, I think they do do a good job of trying to keep everybody informed. Um, they do keep up with the, the meetings, they publish the meetings, they try to get the interaction with the community out there to come to the meetings. Um, they look out for the well-being of the students at all times and their staff. 
they look and try to be financially prudent of everything that they're doing out there as they go, as they're making decisions, they try to keep the public up and informed of all those things. Um, the one thing that I would say that is one of my items that I, I'd like to see more of is we try to get uh, small meetings, small groups out there, and it takes a lot more time. But I know when we've done it for the uh, building project and that stuff, to get the interaction and talk to the community, when they came to that meeting, it was different when they got there in our ground and we talked to them and we went over things, explained it to them. Uh, the atmosphere of when we started till the time we left was just unbelievably good for everybody in that room. Um, they felt good where we were. So I think if you've done that a couple more times, you know, and you got out into the smaller groups where people in different time slots, again, you guys serve a lot of time and I already know that. But if we could make time to try to do that in some certain areas, I think we'd get a little bit more and the community will be able to see some things that would turn around and help us all in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Ann Piero. Um, I have to say that I'm a little biased, but I think that the teachers in this district are, are, um, are fantastic. I've had the experience of having an elementary school student, a middle school student, and a high school student from a parent perspective. Um, and the, the education that uh, my children received, one graduated, and, and two are still receiving, has been incredible. Um, the opportunities uh, that the teachers are doing in the classrooms, uh, the new and innovative pedagogy, the changes in classroom layout have been incredible. Um, and I've had the opportunity to watch um, kids who were sort of passive come out of their shells um, in, in classrooms with um, teachers at all levels. Uh, and I think that our sports programs and the opportunities that we give kids for Votech and Ag and robotics and, and all of the other sort of outside groups has been fantastic. Um, and, I'm, I, and I think that the shift to distance learning and everything that happened at all levels for students, um, that May 13th, you know, 180 was fantastic. I was so proud to be a Bermudian Springs parent when people were talking about what was happening in their districts. And I said, no, Bermudia nailed it. We, we did what we needed to do. Our teachers did what they needed to do and our kids really got um, a great opportunity and the best that they could have gotten under the circumstances. And I was so proud. Um, I think that one of the things that we can do better is that uh, we need to reach out to the parents a little more and explain to them what changes are happening in education. The classrooms don't look today like they looked when a lot of our kids' parents were sitting in classrooms. Um, and so we need to explain how the One to World initiative um, is, is working and why it's important to give these kids access um, to the iPads and that no education isn't just on the computer, although for distance learning, we did have to shift to that. And thank goodness we had the, the opportunity to do that. But to explain to parents why pedagogies are shifting and the, the evidence-based um, strategies that are being used by our teachers and our coaches and our administration to help further education for our students. I really think that that needs to be something that's voiced uh, to, our, to our parent community in, in a language they can understand. I have an advantage. I understand the educational lingo and, and um, a lot of the ABCs of EDU, but um, I think we need to open up and be a little more transparent on why teachers are doing the things that they're doing for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Prosser, um, I believe Bermudian does a <clears throat> very good job with their academics and their extracurricular activities. Uh, being a member of the York Springs Lions Club, I've seen some of the outstanding students uh, that have come out of the school district. Um, I think there's, from what I've gathered and looked at, it looks like the district is about an average school district for the state. So I think there's definitely places that we can improve. Uh, I think there's students that maybe fall through the cracks. Uh, not being an educator, I'm not sure how you how you take care of that, but it's something I think we need to look at. 
Thank you. Thank you. Christian Snyder. Um, so for, for that question, I feel one of the positive things, can you guys still hear up there with the rain? Good, okay. One of the positive thing again is the uh, uh, teachers that are in our school district. Um, my son got to involved in honors last year and what I thought was a nice balance. What our, from our, my wife and I's, our experience on his interaction, they went well beyond to try to work with the kids from home to keep up the ad advanced courses, um, both in chemistry and some other programs. And I like the way they went way over the top to try to make that connection and keep them going and growing. I also agree also with the gentleman who said before, it's also very important to keep up uh, growing in a farm area that I did growing up on a farm, having an ag agricultural experience, but also giving kids maybe aren't growing up on a farm, voc vocational training. Um, I went to medical school. My brother's a diesel mechanic. He has his own business, we, but he has more employees than me. So he's maybe doing a little better than me, I guess. But um, he had that experience. Not only did he have the training, but he had uh, an experience how to run a business, start it up, which he's successful to do today. And I think these kids need, I agree too, not every kid is made to go to uh, college. Uh, there should be a balance, uh, training, uh, vocational training. And I think this school really does op have an opportunity for those doors that open. The one thing I think we need to look ahead, which a different time right now is the psychological effect, I think, with uh, kids having lack of the social interaction is we're gonna have to look in maybe some more efforts to connect with the kids, or whatever program we come up with. Um, I talk to a lot of pediatricians that refer me patients and there is a concern growing uh, with different health issues with the students not having those conditions. And I think it would be pertinent that the school board looks at some of those uh, uh, either courses or teaching, uh, having teachers or somebody responsible to making sure the kids can come to us and saying, hey, I'm not doing so well here. There's a lot of an ed source in California that says kids are really struggling in these paradigms that they're doing. The kids are giving lower rankings. They, they need to connect with a mentor, with a student. And for a lot of these kids in the inner city, schools are everything to them. It's their safety zone. So we gotta make sure we're opening doors, whatever system we come up with, that we can have these kids connect with them and make sure they're doing okay. All right, so that's what I see as an important thing for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Wolf, uh, what Bermudians done well? Um, I would, you know, not to give myself credit, but also Brian himself, you know, we're recent graduates. We're out in the world, we're being successful. I think that speaks volumes as to what, what the administration here, what the, what the community is doing, what the school board is doing. Um, it's, there's, there's been advancements in, in what opportunities have also been put in front of the students. Uh, the prep tech school, um, my sister took advantage of that and is now studying nursing. Um, those are advancements that happened since, since I've been in the, the school system. Um, those are all positive things. It, it, we're trending in the correct direction. Um, improvements, there, there's always room for improvements, right? What's, what's going on in the world today with COVID? There's, there's going to be room for improvements of how we present the education to the students online, whether we're bringing them into school or not. Um, other improvements, just, just advancing opportunities. Um, I know one of the big initiatives or pushes was uh, STEM. Um, getting kids interested in engineering, the sciences, uh, looking at coding. Um, those are all advancements that we can make. I, I know when I graduated, I, I wasn't exposed to C++ coding until I was in a 200 level course in sophomore year of college. Um, you know, I know we're, we're making steps in the correct direction. We're, we're trending. There's just always room for improvement. And that's, that's in any aspect of life, right? Um, the other, the other main, main focus, I guess, that I'd want to hit is, is the technology perspective. Um, the iPads have been a great introduction. Getting the students involved with technology now is all it's doing is advancing. Um, the one other room for improvement, I guess, and I, I don't know if, if we're looking into Chromebooks or not. Um, I know there was talk of that. Um, but but getting, getting the technology into the, the students' hands and showing them how they will use it in the real world. Um, I think it's great that the teachers and everybody have Macs, but the hospitals aren't running Macs, you know, to, to show your EKG of your heart rate. Um, the, the engineering companies aren't showing 
you know, aren't utilizing Max for, for their drafting. Um, technology wise, we can, we can make improvements there. These, these are all little things and we're, we're trending in the correct direction. It's just where, where we put the effort, where we put the financials in, where we make the decisions on. Um, that's, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Worley again. I know you can't see it on Zoom, but I think maybe one of the immediate improvements would be a patch in the roof in the auditorium, because I think I saw a drop of water come down. Um, <laughs> other than that, I think Bermuda does really well. Bermuda has a very good reputation in the community. I, I go around, I go to a lot of schools. Um, Bermudian is, is a good school. I've had foster kids that wanted to be here in the district because of the school. A part of that's a football program, but they wanted to be here in this district. And I've had kids that came to Bermudian from uh, other schools in York and have told me that they love it here, that they don't want to go. Because Bermudian's a very inclusive school. You feel comfortable here. I know when I grew up, I felt comfortable here. Um, the kids I've worked with have felt comfortable here. And I think that's the, the community in general. And it's also, it's the teachers, the administration. Um, it, Bermudian's a good school to work with, a good school to go to. And I, I know when I, was, when I was here back in 95, um, I really enjoyed more than just the academics. I was in the AP classes, I was in the honors classes, but you know what? My favorite class was Mr. Myers and Woodshop. And that's a skill that I use to this day. And I think by offering classes like that, we are really helping the kids, the community, to, to learn more than just, just academics. Because like, I forget who said it, but not everybody's going to go to college. And that's, that's fine. Uh, there's plenty of people that don't go to college that probably are more successful than me and make more than me. Um, so I think we continue doing that. Um, as, for, as for improvements, uh, you know, I think it would be really nice to try to partner with our local townships and boroughs to see what we can do about internet access. That's, that's a struggle for me. Um, I, I'm working a lot from home now. I'm doing a lot of court via Zoom. My wife works from home and our internet is loaded. And then we have uh, distance learning on top of that. That's rough. Now I know the school is getting hot spots. I commend the school for that. Um, but if there's some way we can partner uh, I know Comcast, uh, Embark, or not Embark anymore, CenturyLink now, um, everybody wants contracts. And I think that's something that needs to be done on the local level because really internet is, it's a utility. It's a necessary utility at this point. point. Um, and the lines of communication, one thing I've, it's not just for Mutian, just like a lot of the schools that I deal with, I see a lot of drain to cyber schools and uh, especially special ed drain to cyber schools. And I think we need to promote um, a cyber option here. Uh, I know we have the, uh, the Eagle Academy and um, I, I think there needs to be some extra communication to show how our, our public education, the education provided here either in school or at the cyber option is superior to other, um, to other cyber options because we're taking a lot of our taxpayers' money and giving it out to these other, or some for-profit companies. I think that's something we need to really look into. I wanna keep, we have a limited amount of money. I wanna keep it here in the community with our kids to, uh, to support us and the community. So that's, that's it, thanks. Um, final, uh, Darren, if you would like to answer that question. Yes, uh, thank you, Darren Euchre. Um, I will say right from the start, when my kids moved into the district, uh, they were made to feel welcome. And that happens because teachers, administrators have created a welcoming environment, uh, and that doesn't happen by accident. So I, what I will say uh, in terms of positives for the district, I think there are a multitude of well-rounded options for kids depending on their type of learning uh, and their type of ability and then their type of future career goals. Uh, sitting with my uh, son last year going through what was to be freshman orientation and hearing about the different trajectories that kids could go on for those that wanted college and those that felt they were more voc vocational uh, minded or agriculture minded 
uh, tremendous opportunities there. Uh, and the technology that's available, uh, the fact that my kids were able to take iPads home uh, and learn during this pandemic uh, was, was fairly tremendous. So that has been a great investment uh, that the school has made. Um, I will say just in terms of things to improve upon, communication can always be improved upon. Uh, and and that's, the, that's a goal of, of any board uh, or any government. Um, and I will say, especially as we get close to reopening, that the communication that we give to parents is clear, is concise, uh, and is easily understood and is communicated through multiple channels, uh, just so that in these uncertain times, we know to the best of our abilities what our kids can expect when they go back to school. Um, the only other thing that I would, I would mention is do wonder if uh, there's more that we can be doing at the middle school level to encourage uh, vocational uh, education, uh, to expose kids to those uh, STEM careers uh, and those careers that don't require a four-year college degree. Wonder if at the seventh and eighth grade level, if uh, there is some opportunities there to just give them a taste so that when they go into high school, uh, that they have uh, know that there's multiple career options out there and multiple opportunities as opposed to uh, just the college prep route. Thank you. Thank you. And for our final question for everyone, what are the two strongest attributes or talents that you can bring to the board? Uh, I feel that, don't forget to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, Brian Davis. Um, two attributes that, that I would bring to the board um, as, a, as a business owner, uh, I, on a daily basis, uh, I'm in communication with my workers, uh, you know, managing employees, managing tasks, uh, multitasking, going, going every which way some days. And um, it, it really has, has taught me to manage time effectively and, and get, prioritize what I need to get done and, and make sure that, that those most important items get done and, and maybe you have to put off some of the less important items for tomorrow. Uh, I, I think that's probably my strongest attribute. Um, and, and my second positive attribute, I think would be uh, my involvement in the community. I'm a member of the York Springs Lions Club, a member of the Adams County Fruit Growers Association, the Adams County Farm Bureau. I, I'm very in touch with the the agricultural community and, and the York Springs and, and Bermudian community. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today and, and voice my, my opinions and, and the reasons that I believe I'd make a good board member. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mike Farley. Um, the two that I would say, I guess, one, my experience as a substitute and as a full-time teacher, um, and uh, more recently, my experience now, and um, been there for about 12 years as the manager of the teen department, and what I see and what I hear, uh, the kids that talk to me, um, see a lot that people don't know and what these kids go through on a daily basis. I have some of the... Um, more of the less fortunate ones that come to the library all the time and spend their day there. Uh, most of them don't have internet at home and has bad home situations. So I see it from that perspective it, um, that I can bring that to the board. Of course, it's in a different area, but I'm, the kids are the same all, all over. Um, so that's pretty much the main two things that I would say. Thank you. Mary Kemper, um, number one, um, I'm alumni, parent, coach, long time interaction and involvement with the Bermudian Spring School District and the community. Number two, medical professional with the specialty in pediatrics for 19 years. So I've had a long history with many of our students, many of the parents, teachers, um, and some of their kids now, the students' kids now as they've graduated and still in the area. So I have a different perspective to bring to the school board from the medical perspective, the mental health perspective, disciplinary perspective, educationally 
as I've come through the years, um, just in diverse way with the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Lee Milner. One thing I bring to the, um, to the group of candidates is my public administration background. So having spent 12 years in the state government in various roles and in continued advancing in those roles to get a general understanding of how to run a large, in this case, organization, um, and to understand the components, the, the small things that make that work and the larger um, bureaucracy in which you have to work, um, the rules for your procurement, the rules for your collective bargaining, your budget constraints, understanding that you have mandated programs that you have to fund, you have teacher salaries that you have to fund, and then there's a very little bit of money left to play around with to do the things that you would like to do to be inventive. So I would say that, that those 12 years of being in increasing um, levels of responsibility um, are, are one aspect. And then the second is I'm a parent. I'm a parent with elementary school age children. I have two elementary school age nephews. When my children started school, I became involved. I looked for my niche. Where would I fit in? Where are my skill sets? Um, valuable and I found that in the PTO. I chair, I co-chair a committee and um, it is a way to show the teachers who teach my children that I appreciate what they can do for, for my children and for my community. And by being in the school, I get to interact with the kids. I go into classrooms. I volunteer in the classrooms with my kids, with my nephews. So I get to see the interaction with the, between the children and the teachers. I get to help kids I, when I go in. Sometimes they just like to see a friendly face. Other times I'm helping um, teach kids who don't know how to tell time, how to tell time. But being a parent is also another asset for me to be on the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan Lair. Um, what I can bring to the school board is, you know, staying out into the public, uh, talking to everybody that's out there, being a business owner, I can bring the business side of it. Um, one of the biggest and the hardest challenges that we face of sitting up there is being able to sit there, look at the tough questions, find out the answers, you know, to be able to relay those questions back to the public. Um, sometimes sitting there, you have to be level-headed. You have to have the right attitude when you come into it. And you have to ask everybody bringing you the questions and be able to inform good answers back from them and ask them the tough questions. Why do we want to do this? Or why do you guys want this to happen? You know, the other thing is, is, you know, with, I have boys, like I said, that came through, I have grandchildren coming through. Um, and, you know, I, I look out for the community at part, you know, I appreciate you guys, what all you do. You guys got a tough decision in front of you today. This is one of your tough ones. You got great uh, interviewees here. So I appreciate everything. And like I say, hopefully I answered your questions and we can move on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Ampiro. Um, I think that my two greatest attributes are that I'm a teacher and a learner. Uh, I've been a part of this community uh, since, uh, the, since August of 2000 when I stepped foot in here as a teacher and I've had the opportunity to meet um, and become uh, friends with many of the parents in this community. Um, I've actually had um, some of the kids, some of the school board members, I had their, their children as students. There are a couple guys in here that had me as a teacher as well, I guess. Um, but um, I got the opportunity in that aspect to um, meet so much of our community and learn how large and diverse that it, that it is. Um, and I also know what's going on in educational pedagogy right now. I know where the shifts are happening. Um, and I really think that um, the perspective of someone who's still currently in it and being a part of the educational shifts 
that are so important to our kids and that Bermudian has always been on the forefront of um, is really important. And I, would, I, I think that that's a really important attribute to bring um, to a school board. The other attribute is being a learner. I'm a consummate learner. I am always trying to find things out. Um, if I don't understand something, I'm the one who asks the questions. I'm willing to ask the hard questions and I'm willing to be asked the hard questions um, to find out as much as I can before making a decision. Um, I, I've never stopped my education uh, in between the master's and the uh, doctorate. I have two other certificates of um, education uh, in there that I've worked on. So I'm hoping that to bring my teacher perspective and my consummate learner perspective to the school board would be um, some of my greatest attributes. And I thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Prosser. Um, I think one of the attributes I bring to being a school board member would be the passion. Uh, I graduated from Bermudian. Uh, I've lived in Bermudian. Uh, and I don't think there's anything more challenging than to see the young people taught and to make them better parts of the community. Uh, and also, uh, I have the time. Uh, I retired in January uh, after a 25 year career as a parts technician. So I have the time to attend the meetings and look at the figures and the written it looks like there's quite a bit of written material to look over. Uh, so those are the attributes I bring. Thank you. Thank you. Christian Snyder. Um, one of the best things I think I can contribute is my experience. Um, one thing is being a physician in Hanover, I've served on different credentialing boards. I served in the executive board, the medical director board, but the Hanover Surgery Center. I was in charge uh, before I created the system. There was a lot of foot and ankle surgeons and it was haphazard with a call schedule. I was in charge of forming a call schedule under the Department of Surgery and has been in uh, kind of representing a credentialing ever since that in 2000 that I formed that. Um, I worked with um, a lot of executives in the hospital uh, as far as things with the hospital. And um, I could also benefit in a lot of your meetings. It's nothing more challenging to sit through a two hour surgical meeting with a lot of uh, uh, surgeons with uh, big attitudes. So I'm sure I could contribute. <laughs> um, one thing too is uh, I've had a lot of experience with the kids. I've got to know the families really well. Um, from coaching 10 years soccer, working with scouts, I really know the families. There's great families in this community. There's great kids. Uh, I've never been more honored to take kids away at a far away activity with the scouts and see how good our kids behave on these away adventures. Uh, the parents trust me to be in a higher venture in the Appalachian Trail. They trust me to sail a sailboat around Florida. And I know they trust me representing our kids in this school district. Um, I feel that uh, the experience, the leadership, and uh, also just being uh, very easy to work with, I think, in my history of working um, in both education uh, and the medical arena. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Wolf, my two greatest attributes. Uh, the first one is I covered in my introduction. I think I'll bring a, a unique uh, perspective to the board. Um, having graduated from, from Bermudian within the past 10 years, uh, from, from college within the past five, um, I'm not a parent uh, that was sending my child through school. I was this child going through school, through Bermudian, through Penn State, through the different opportunities that were presented to me. Um, the, the, the great thing is, is I'm still learning and growing, um, not only as, as, a, as a community member, but as a father. Um, I'm getting exposed to international business. I have to understand what's going on in the world, not just the community. Um, so that's, that's the first attribute is, is my perspective, it's unique. Um, the, the second is, is the potential that I have. Um, and some of you may question, what do you mean by potential? I have a, an eight month old who's gonna go through this school. I'm going to be involved with this school over the next 20, 30, 40 years as I continue to grow and live in this school district. So not only are the decisions that are happening now going to affect me, but I can watch them as they develop over the next course of years you know, the course of the timeline. Um, I believe those are my two greatest attributes and I thank you guys for the time. 
Thank you. Dan Worley again. I guess the things I hold dear to my heart, I can promise you I, I'll be open, honest, respectful. I think respect is huge. Um, it doesn't matter if it's, it's students or the people in the audience, that that's important. And I've always been able to, I've always prided myself, I've always been able to remain respect, uh, respectful and, um, and treat everybody the way they deserve to be treated. Um, I'm also, I'll keep it short, I guess I'm also an eternal optimist. Uh, the work that I do, you have to be. Um, there, things are gonna turn out okay. And you just have to keep that in your mind and you have to just keep working toward that. Um, things are gonna be okay. We're going through some tough times, but things will work out. And, um, and I think that's a good mindset to go into whatever type, whatever job or you know, board or whatever. I think it's, it's good to have that mindset. Um, I don't know if I have a chance to talk to you again, but I appreciate this chance to, to be, have to interview before you. And I appreciate what you do. I know you don't do it for the money. I know you don't do it for the glory. You do it because you care. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, Darren. Thanks again for the opportunity to uh, participate, to interview, and to do so remotely. Greatly appreciated. My two, uh, I think, bring us biggest strengths that I bring uh, would be I have a deep understanding of how organizations and government works, uh, and I know the importance of listening, uh, but also asking, you know, the the pointed questions that help arrive at a good solution. And then secondarily, as others have mentioned, I'm a parent, uh, so I have a just a uh, a deep invested interest in making sure that Bermudian is the best that it can be uh, for the time that my kids are going to be here, uh, but also for those that are going to be coming up behind. Um, I think that is probably the greatest strength that I have is I'm coming to this as a parent, uh, but I do have organizational uh, and government understanding about the process. So I feel like I could get myself quickly up to speed uh, to the issues that are facing the district. Thank you again. Thank you. So that, um, those are all of the questions that we formally had. And so now it's, it's um, up to the board if you had any additional questions, you had anything to follow up on. And if you do, don't forget to unmute yourself so that folks can hear you. So I'll kind of leave it to the board. Um, also, uh, when we get to a certain point, if there aren't any questions, this is where we will take. If there are any public comments that we're monitoring, we will include that as the next agenda item. Are there any additional questions? Okay. Um, okay, then we'll move on. Before we move on to public comments, I do want to say thank you so much uh, for your time uh, to take the effort to join us today for an hour and a half uh, interview session. Uh, so just uh, from a, a point of process, we will take, open up to public comments because our first board action after public comments will be uh, the selection of, uh, of the candidate. So um, any public comments? At this time, there are no comments out there. Okay. We do have to give a little bit of time because there is a delay uh, to the live stream. No comments. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, now we will be moving to the uh, item eight, board member appointment. So at this point, uh, we will open up for any nominations. This is Jen Zerfing. I move to appoint Amanda Milner so we can start the discussion. This is Matt Nelson. I second that nomination or motion even. Are there any other nominations? Actually, uh, I'm just going to get some clarification here. Uh, Brooke Say, solicitor, 
Um, do we take one nomination of the motion, close it conversation, and have to vote it up and down, or can you have multiple? You should have all uh, nominations at one time. I prefer that all nominations have a second. That way we know we might have enough votes to move forward. Um, at the time we think nominations have ceased, we should have a motion uh, to close nominations. And then depending on the number of candidates we have, what we can do is just do a voice roll call where each member votes for the candidate of their selection. Um, the selected candidate who will become the new school board member needs five votes. So if we have to do multiple votes, that would occur. So we would give time for nominations, close nominations, and then we, we would have it was uh, the question was really had eight members but it still requires a majority correct it requires five yes okay two four okay all right so we have okay so it sounds like what we will do is we will take all nominations there must be a nomination in a second once nominations are done we will take a roll call vote and each member will vote for the nominee of their choice. A majority must prevail to seat a member. So if through that process of you selecting which one that were nominated, if somebody gets five, they would get the nomination. It's right. Yes. Just now. Okay, so I have a, we have a, a motion uh, for Jordan Laird. Do I have a second? I would second that motion. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Do we have any other nominations? Okay, can I have a motion to close the nomination? I make the motion to close the nominations. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I, I will just ask for, for audience participants, even when you're making a motion or a second, I think identify yourself so folks in the audience virtually know who's, who's made that. Thank you. And this is the solicitor. This is Jen Zerfing. I just, we're, part, we're in discussion yes. anyway. I just want to say that. Um, I, we have so many great people to choose from. And I really, really appreciate your time coming out. And it took me two whole sheets of paper to, to make my grid and make my decision. And so thank you for everything that you've brought to the table. Mr. President, just a, a point of order. If you could just do a voice vote on the motion to close nominations, and then we would do an official vote um, by each member voicing aloud the candidate they support. Okay, thank you, thank you, Brooke. We need a uh, we need a motion, and we we made the motion to close the nomination and have a second. Now we need to do a roll call vote. No, she said roll. Just a voice vote to officially close the nomination, okay. and then a roll call where each member announces the candidate they support after nominations are officially closed. Got it. So all those in favor of closing nominations, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Any discussion? Excuse me, Mike, what, what are we discussing? If there's any discussion regarding the candidates. I, I, it's on. This is Rich Stern. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're a good housekeeper, by the way. <laughs> Mike. Um, I wanted to share that um, also what Jen said, that we have some fantastic uh, applicants sitting out here. And I know how awkward it is to sit out there, because I sat out there, too. <laughs> Matt, Matt knows what that's like as well. And uh, it's, uh, it is an awkward process. and. Uh, but it is the process. 
and, and you can't say we're, we're violating the sunshine rules, so that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> but um, the two candidates that are on the slate right now are excellent candidates. Jordy, who is uh, a good friend and, and a respected person that has been on the board here for a long time. Thank you. And Amanda, you're just, you're, your, your resume speaks volumes, and we appreciate that you're here as well. Um, the, the experience that Amanda could bring to the board with uh, knowing the, the Pennsylvania budget, uh, the nuances of the Pennsylvania budget, I'm assuming you still know people in Pennsylvania that work on the budget, is it not? That's <laughs> That's, uh, that's, that's a pretty amazing resume, I think. And that's, that's what I wanted to share with the rest of the board. Okay. And I know that this is tough, but just as much as we can, as far as process, if you're not talking, try to mute your microphone and unmute because of the echo and the audience. It's really, so I'd rather kind of take time between conversation, just to make sure that, that people watching can hear clearly and that there are, there are really no issues, so thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Mike, I have a question, it's Ruth Griffey. Um, when we're done discussing this and you take the vote, the vote, do you say the candidate you would prefer or do, you, do we do one vote and then another vote? So since there are two candidates, um, theoretically we should get it, be able to get it in one, one vote because it should be a majority. For either either one but do we just you use, select the candidate that you choose so when we vote we select the candidate that we're voting for yes. thank you okay you're welcome you just say their name out loud so okay with no further discussion uh that we call them, oh, i'm sorry i was just I, I would just like to say thank you as well to all the candidates we have um, who you are this is Matt Nelson. So first, I'd just like to say thanks for all the candidates. Like Richard said, I also went through the same process. So I know it is very nerve wracking and difficult to, uh, to answer all those questions under the spotlight. Um, Amanda is a candidate then um, that I seconded. I think some of the experiences she brought, she overlaps a lot of the candidates that we have out here. And I think she's one of the candidates though that kind of encompasses a lot of all the things that all of our candidates did. You know, her experience as a parent, we have lots of parents here. Um, she has an experience as a farmer. So I think that's an important experience to bring to our, to our board as well then too. We had some farmers out there as well. And then also that experience on a state budget then too. I know as, that's some of the things that I'm still learning and still trying to do myself as a board member then too. That's, that's a big challenge as Mike, as you often say that one of our most important roles as a school board member is to review and analyze the budget. That's the, or the number one thing that we do here each day. So the fact that Amanda's already was able to oversee an $11 billion budget, I think it was, but much, much bigger than the budgets that we do already. So that type of experience I think is very, very valuable. One of the things that I also really like and I value as a school board member myself is that we always put public education first. Amanda spoke directly to public education. A lot of our other candidates did speak to that, but she went to the students first. Plus also that entire compassing then too, that not only does she understand our responsibilities to the students first, but then to the teachers, then to the administrators, and still also to ultimately to the taxpayers. So I think that type of experience and that type of belief is something that we need on our school board. Um, to reiterate and stuff that, about our kindness initiatives then too, that she has direct links with our own administrators and has been in the building on very often with our principals to see the kindness initiative. If anything, listen to her story, I think I should have done a better job as a parent then too, to, I knew well of that kindness initiative then too, but to reinforce it then too, that was very, that was very impressive. And then also out of all the candidates then too, to have that idea, regardless of how this vote goes then too, the idea of engaging our Hispanic population, I think is something that I've, I've noticed and talked to the PTO then too, because we don't always see them in our communities as often, you know, so we have to make sure we reach out. And the idea of incorporating Spanish as a top down from K through 12 is a great idea that I think our school board and school district should investigate and spend some time anyway. So, and that was a great idea that she brought to the school board today. So I think that's impressive and speaks highly of her candidacy. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Okay, Doug, you may call the roll. Make sure you unmute yourself when you vote. And identify. And identify yourself. And, and just as a, so I understand, 
they're responding with the candidate. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. So Ruth Griffey. Ruth Griffey, Amanda Lee Milner. Douglas Knight. Jordan Lair. Matthew Nelson. Matthew Nelson, uh, Amanda Lee Milner. David Reinecker. David Reinecker, Jordan Lair. Richard Sterner. Uh, Richard Sterner, Amanda Lee Milner. Corey Trosel. Corey, Corey Trosel, Jordan Lair. Michael Wool. Mike Wool, Jordan Lair. Jen Zerfing. Jen Zerfing, Amanda Lee Milner. So the vote was four for Amanda Lee Milner and four for Jordan Lair. So no candidate has been approved uh, and you will need to continue to vote until one of those two candidates is officially um, appointed to the position or if the board wishes, uh, it could go back and attempt a nomination of an additional candidate. Are we allowed more discussion? This is Jen Zerfing. Absolutely, I would highly recommend it uh, because you don't want to be like the school board I had one time that voted 15 times. So no, this is Jen Zerfing again. No disrespect to Jordy because I think Jordy did a fantastic job when he was on the board. And, you know, normally I would think, you know, it'd be an easy choice to have you back. I'm most looking forward to having some, um, some fresh input in the board, which is why I went the direction that I went. So I certainly hope that you, Jordy, don't feel any disrespect from, from me. And I hope that some of you might reconsider that while Jordy has brought great things to the board, um, Amanda has also great things and uh, a fresh uh, perspective that we may not have ever considered before some of the new ideas that she may have. This is uh, Doug Knight, uh, just to kind of throw in, in my perspective on this, um, you know, my looking at it in, in what we're doing is we're filling, filling a partial term, right? Um, Jordy has experience with what we're doing right now, right? He was a part of getting it started. Um, things like the middle school project and you know, some of the technology that's been brought into the district, he, you know, unfortunately had to, you know, vacate his position because of a, you know, a geographical boundary, um, you know, and that's where my point of view is coming from, right? That it's basically what a year and a half term, I think that we're filling, um, you know, after that, it would be up to the public. Any other comments? Now, this is this is Mike. I'll I'll throw in my two cents. So there are definitely uh, there's always it was always nice to have fresh ideas. Uh, we also have fresh problems. Uh, that um, for me, it's 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 a it's a, it's a, a little bit about continuity, uh, and. Uh, and the fact that there's really, we have a already house broken, so to speak, board member uh, that, has, that has done this role. They know, they know their role um, and, and is very familiar with the strategy and the plans of the district. Uh, and to, to Doug's point, this is a partial term and that there will be a, uh, an election that, you know, that will fill the seat for a full term uh, when the time comes. 
Uh, so that, that's, that's probably the main driving force for me for, um, for supporting Jordy because of, of, his, of his experience. Um, and, and frankly, one of the things that I've always appreciated about Jordy on, on his time on the board is, you know, he would, um, he'd ask a tough question. I mean, he would boil it down and cut right to the chase. And uh, th that is something that uh, I, I really appreciated because that's part of the reason why we're here is, you know, is to, to kind of really just to, to I don't wanna say simplify the problem, but to, to get to the root of it so that we could make better informed decisions. I think he did a, a, a great job challenging our administrators um, when issues would arise and, and, and ensuring that not just that issue was addressed, but that it wouldn't arise again. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where, where I am from a, a support perspective. Mike, I have further comments, okay? Mm -hmm. um, this is Matt Nelson again. Um, I agree, I, I appreciate, you know, Jordan's past contributions to the, to the board, and I appreciate the, the comments that you and, and Doug were just saying. Uh, I think a lot of the times is some of the things, the experience that we already have on the board as the newest board member, you know, so I'm still learning a lot of experience, and I think I've relied on you and some, you, Mike Wool, and some of the other um, board members to help me get gain that experience. So we already have on this board already have many experienced members that we have people here that already have the knowledge and the experience that can help us get through the, the minutia of board meetings and help us learn what are the right questions to ask Dr. Hotchkiss and maybe what aren't the right questions to ask Dr. Hotchkiss, those types of things then too. So you've all, you already fill that role specifically and, and Doug and Corey and, and Dave and Ruth, all these, you know, we have experience on the board already. What the thing that we don't have on the board as well then too, I, I wish I had a different word than the fresh perspective. We did talk about that then too, but, but our new ideas then as a different way to look at things then too. So our board has done things a particular way for a long time and we've been very successful and you and, and under Jordan's leadership have done a lot of great things for Bermudian. It's the reason why I love Bermudian, the reason I'm sitting up here and the reason all these candidates came here today. But I think for us moving forward, then we need to get some other ideas and some other perspectives. And that's exactly what Amanda will bring to the table. She has experience that's unique, that's different than a lot of the rest of us have. You know, a state government background is a unique experience and a firsthand involvement already. She already goes above and beyond and she was already looking for opportunities to work in our community and our school long before the opportunity for the school board came up. So when there wasn't an opportunity for the school board, she was still in the schools volunteering for the PTO. She was still helping with our teachers every day. And that interaction at all levels then too, I think is also unique. You know, the little bit that I did with the PTO back in the day, but you know, it was just helping the kids or, or being in the classrooms then too. But you know, Amanda went to the next level then to, to understand what the teachers need, to understand the interactions of what the teachers didn't have that the PTO could then work with. And then to support the administrators at that next level then too, that that was just an example of how her, her go get is just something that I think is really valuable. And when we have an opportunity to add something like that to the school board, I would like us not to miss that opportunity. Thank you. I'm going to throw in two more cents, if I may. Rich Turner speaking. Um, I have nothing but respect for Jordan. In fact, I agree with everything you guys have said about Jordan. And uh, yeah, I I would like to go down and shake his hand if I was allowed to <laughs> this day and age. But um, I, I also can see what Amanda brings to us. And I'm just gonna read two things off of her resume. <clears throat> Executive budget analyst, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Governor's Budget Office, Division of Health and Human Services. Also, daily management of farming operations, sales, property maintenance, human resources, projects, and budgets, farming operations. I mean, she knows the local, she knows Harrisburg. And um, my dad used to say, I don't know whether to go to Harris, I don't know whether to go to Pittsburgh or eat a piece of cheese. My dad used to say that. And I thought, well, this isn't, this isn't that much of a puzzle right now. And uh, uh, I'm looking at this like I used to look at applicants for a teaching job. And I'm thinking, boy, I really like this guy, but look what this person brings to the position. 
and this person brings to the position um, this much, this much, but I really like this guy, but this person brings to the position this much. And that's why my vote is for Amanda Milner instead of my good friend, Jordy Lair. And Mike, can I add one more thing? This is Jen Zerfing. Um, I, I also, I highly value what you said about Jordy's already been with us on the project. He's already done the hard meetings and asked the hard questions. And I appreciate that. I also know that Amanda is the kind of person who does her homework. Something that she said um, in her comments um, that made me believe that she's already read the, the board organization like documents. I, I remember what the thing is. She already read that stuff just in preparation for this interview. And so I would say to mitigate your concerns is that what she lacks in former experience on this particular board, I believe she will more than make up for in research and doing her homework. And uh, I, don't, I don't believe we'll have to hold her hand. Um, and I also appreciate that she does have kids in the district and, and I believe that she um, you know, cares just as much as Jordy and all of the people that came here um, about making sure that she does the very best job, just as Jordy would make sure that he did the very best job. Um, I, that's, that's what I'm saying. She, she'll make up for it in homework. Any other comments, discussion? Okay, Doug, call the roll. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. The other region is East Berlin Borough and Latimer Township. At present, with the eight members sitting here, we have all those municipalities represented except East Berlin Borough. And, and our forefathers back in the 1950s, 60s, when they set this all up this way, did so with a purpose. And that purpose was so that all residents of Bermudian Springs could feel comfortable geographically in having a board member near to them and maybe their next door neighbor to represent them. And I thought, I think it's a, a very, uh, very good principle and it had a, had a, it possessed a lot of wisdom even back then. Um, Jordy does reside now in the East Berlin borough in an area that 
we don't have representation at this point here on the stage. And I guess that was my, that was my deciding factor between these two, that uh, these two, I, I, I know that there's not, we don't have a, a, a loser. We can't make a wrong decision here. Um, we've got an apple and an orange. Each one brings its own, his or her own gifts and talents. And I just wanted to express to you what my thinking was in stepping back to look at the forest for the trees. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mr. President, Ruth Griffey. I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I would too like to thank all of the candidates for coming. You've been a great group. And I'm, I'm glad to see so many people interested in coming to this. I would also like to invite all of you or as many of you that possibly could come to our actual board meetings. The actual caucus meetings are on a Monday night and that's where we do a lot of discussing. And I would appreciate more input from the community and any of you are more than welcome to come and see what we're all about on a Monday night. And thank you again for putting yourselves out there. That's it. Thank you. Any further discussion? One more thing. I don't disagree with, with Dave. I think Dave's, Dave makes a good point. Um, but I don't, I don't think at this point, we don't, I don't want to penalize anybody for living in the wrong spot either. And as, uh, as an appointed official or as an elected official, we might be uh, delegated in a particular spot in, in Bermudian Springs School District, but I also think it's our duty to represent everybody in Bermudian Springs School District as well. It's like, we're not like waitresses that say, I'm sorry, you're not, on, you're not at my table and I don't pour coffee for you. I represent everybody and I pour coffee for anybody that's in Bermudian Springs School District because I think that's part of my duty as a school board member. Although the point is not lost that Dave is making, but I think that when board elections come along, I think there are those opportunities to make sure that we, I feel like Mr. Miyagi, we can find balance at that point. But right now I think, uh, uh, there are more important things to consider at this point. Although I want to say today that the, the point is not lost. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Uh, Mike, this is Matt Nelson again. I just wanted to add one other comment. Um, I do think the re over overall representation on our board um, we need more diverse. We talk often about types of diversity. So we have an opportunity to add diversity here. The fact then that we already have two women, you know, Jen and Ruth, I think the idea of adding seating a third woman can also provide that diversity. We're in a, the, the demographics of our district are the same, but the majority of our teachers are women then too. And even as the father of daughters, I often seek out strong women role models then too. So I think the idea to have more women in positions of power when we have an opportunity to do that, I think that's valuable and something that should be considered. It's not, you know, that's why we didn't, we haven't talked about it before then too. Amanda has many other great characteristics, but I think that is not something all that we should also overlook. Any other comments? Okay. Go ahead. Ruth Griffey. Ruth Griffey, Amanda Lee Milner. Douglas Knight, Jordan Lair. Matthew Nelson. Uh, Amanda Lee Milner. David Reinecker. David Reinecker. Jordan Lair. Richard, Richard Sterner. Richard Sterner, Amanda Milner. 
Corey Trussell. Corey Trussell. Jordan Lear. Michael Wool. Mike Wool. Jordan Lear. Jennifer Zerfing. Jennifer Zerfing. Amanda Lee Milner. Vote stands at 4 4. No candidate has been appointed. Does our solicitor have any, <laughs> any guidance? I can't remember. So, um, I've had this experience before. Um, and uh, you can deal with this really any way. There's no statutory description on how the actual appointment takes place. Sometimes hearing from the candidates again, uh, sometimes hearing um, people talk about what they're on the fence for, uh, sometimes uh, seeing if the candidates themselves wanna continue in a contested election. Um, it, there's a lot of different ways this can go. You can keep talking among each other, or you can ask the candidates to weigh in about whether they still wanna proceed. And then eventually you will have to vote again. But there is, there is no solution other than uh, at least one individual changing their vote. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah Jordy, you can come up to the, the, the podium and can we, can, can we get him mic so people can hear him? And um, Ms. Miller, we'll give you an opportunity also to, to speak to the board if you choose. This is Jordan Lair. I wanted to address you guys and let you know, I appreciate you guys looking at me, thinking about me and going through, because I know how difficult it is for you guys up here. I know that. So my thing is, is you have a strong candidate. I sat there for 18 years, guys. So it is nothing for me to concede to Amanda, because I think you guys have got a strong candidate. I appreciate your votes. We always sat there in unity to make a decision, to pass on to the public and to pass on to the people out there. You guys stick together and pick your strong candidate that you have. You know, because I think you guys are making the right choice I feel good at being in the community, being able to tell you guys that, and I appreciate you guys thinking of me and let me be here today. That's really what I wanted to tell you guys to, like I say, call your votes and take your good candidate. Thank you. Ms. Miller, do you have anything you would like to add? He'll come over and get your mic. <laughs> Again, I know that you're in a hard position up there and I wanted to thank Mr. Laird for the concession because I know that he is also a strong candidate and that you are in a position where you're trying to compare two very different people. And we both recognize that. And I have sat and watched him in board meetings and watched him pull together a board to have them make just difficult decisions. So I know that he knows how to lead you. And I know he knows how to be a community leader because I've seen him do that. I offer you something very different. Um, it's not that I don't know how to make consensus. I, I've done that for years in my profession. Um, and I do it as a family farmer because family farms and family businesses do not run smoothly all the time because they are your family and they're your workmates and uh, you have a lot of similarities but differences. So I work in my family as a consensus builder as well. And I just wanted to thank the board for the opportunity and um, Jordy. 
Thank you. Justin, just keep that keep that mic open because when we do we do um, go through this, Carol will have to do the oath and let's, let's use the hot mic there. Okay. Any further discussion? I move to call the question. I move to call the question. Do I have a second? Second, Rich Stern. Okay. And I believe that is a roll call, or not a roll call, but a uh, voice vote. All those in favor? You want to you ask Brooke first if we can voice vote? Voice vote on calling the question. That's all you're answering to. There's going to be another roll call vote on the candidate of your selection. Right. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Doug, please call the roll. Ruth Griffey. Ruth Griffey, Amanda Lee Milner. Douglas Knight, Amanda Lee Milner. Matthew Nelson. Amanda Lee Milner. David Reinecker. David Reinecker, Amanda Lee Milner. Richard Sterner. Richard Sterner. Amanda Lee Milner, but Jordy Lair is a class act. Corey Trussell. Corey Trussell. Amanda Lee Milner. Michael Wall. Michael Wall. Amanda Lee Milner. Jennifer Zerping. Jennifer Zerping. Amanda Lee Milner. Eight votes for Amanda Lee Milner. Motion passes and the candidate could come forward to receive the oath of office. Okay, so uh, Amanda Lee Milner has been elected to our to fill our open board position. Carol Tucker will administer the oath. Please um, come up to the podium. At this time, I'd like to administer the oath of office. Ms. Milner, would you please read that aloud? I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support, obey, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth, and that I will discharge the duties of my office with fidelity. Thank you. You can sit and I'll have it. At this time, I will have her sign the oath and it will be official. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we are gonna take a 15 minute recess. And Mr. Wool, the minutes can reflect that Ms. Milner took uh, her seat and she can be included in attendance in the minutes. Very good, Very good. thank you.
those for those of you who just joined the meeting, if you could please mute yourselves. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. And uh, we'll move on to item nine, approval of uh, previous minutes. Corey Trosel, motion to approve. And preserving second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, moving on to um, financial reports. Uh, general fund part A. Move to approve. Yeah, Rich Turner, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. General Fund Part B. Rich Turner, motion to approve. Corey Trussell, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Ruth Griffey. Yes. Douglas Knight, abstain. Amanda Milner. Yes. Matthew Nelson. Yes. David Reinecker. Yes. Richard Sterner. Yes. Corey Trosel. Yes. Michael Wool. Yes. Jennifer Zerping. Yes. Eight yes, one abstain. Motion carries. Uh, General Fund Part C. Rich Sterner, motion to approve. Second, Ruth Griffey. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Doug, please call the roll. Ruth Griffey. Yes. Douglas Knight. Yes. Amanda Milner. Yes. Matthew Nelson. Yes. Yes. David Ronecker. Yes. Richard Sterner. Yes. Corey Trussell. Yes. Michael Wool. Abstain. Jennifer Zerfing. Yes. Eight yes, one abstain. Okay, motion carries. Cafeteria fund, part A. Ruth Griffey, motion to approve. Jennifer Zerfing, second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Cafeteria fund, part B. Corey Trussell, motion, motion to approve. approve. Dave Reinick, your second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Doug, please call the roll. Ruth Griffey. Yes. Douglas Knight. Yes. Amanda Milner. Yes. Matthew Nelson. Yes. David Ronecker. Yes. Richard Sterner. Yes. Corey Trussell. Yes. Michael Wool. Abstain. Jennifer Zerfing. Yes. Eight yes, one abstain. Okay, motion carries. Capital Reserve Fund. And preserving, move to approve. Rich Sterner, second. I have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. A4, construction fund. Rich Sterner, motion to approve. Corey Trussell, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Okay, moving on to our fund reports. General fund. Rich Sterner, motion to approve. Jennifer Zerfing, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Cafeteria fund. Rich Turner, motion to approve. Ruth Griffey, second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Construction fund report. Corey Trestle, motion to approve. Rich Turner, second. second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Scholarship fund. Um, Mr. Mr. President, I believe we skipped the capital reserve fund. Okay, we may have which is letter D. Okay, we'll go back to that one. Move to, move to approve the capital reserve fund, Dave Reinecker. Thank you. Rich Sterner, second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, moving item F, scholarship fund. Ruth Griffey, motion to approve the scholarship funds. Jennifer Zerfing, second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Activity, Activity funds. funds. Rich Turner, Turner motion to approve. To approve. Corey, Corey Trescher, second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in All favor? favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Hearing of scheduled delegations, none. Uh, we have some correspondence that we'll be addressing later in the agenda. Uh, reports in related action. Uh, Dr. Hotchkiss has a, a presentation that he will be making. Good afternoon, good early evening, everyone. Give me a minute here. Just a reminder to me. What I'm going to share with you, you otherwise it um, today, today is an update from what you heard last week. week. There, there are a few slides that um, you'll, you'll notice, notice three repeats, repeats, but there's, but there's um, a, lot a lot of information here um, to, kind to kind of guide the health, health and safety planning, planning team's recommendation um, for, for consideration of the school, school building. The recommendation is based on. on the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Department, Department of Education, Education Department, Department of Health, Health guidance, guidance, as well as, as parents, students, students, and staff input and feedback that we've received in the past weeks since the draft, draft and then um, certainly, um, certainly um, input, input that has happened prior to the draft even coming out. Again, Again this slide I, I shared previously, um, the health and safety plan is mandated by PDE. You have to have flexibility in your plan to address um, the green and yellow phases. Um, you need to include strategies to safely reopen schools, communicate with the public and uh, PD for stakeholders. Um, so you must approve the plan and we are required to submit it to the Department of Education. The Department of Education does not approve the plan, they collect them. And then once our plan is approved, we will post it to the district website. I, I wanna go back, I think a key piece as well, um, this is a living document. So as guidance continues to be revised, which I'm highly anticipating will happen, we will need to continue to revise uh, the plan to maintain uh, our compliance with, with mandates, any mandate that could be placed upon us. Here's a timeline I shared previously, and this just highlights where we are right now. So um, we would like board action today on the health and safety plan so that tomorrow um, we plan to share out the approved plan um, we have each of our buildings have created videos um, with messages to all of our families about what things would look like in our buildings. Um, we have just lots of information to share out. 
And more importantly, we have valuable information to collect to help guide our planning. So on July 16th, yes, one day after we presented the draft health and safety plan last week, um, all school districts in Pennsylvania received significant guidance from the Department of Education, as well as the Department of Health. What I'm gonna be sharing with you over the next few slides are highlights. Um, when we share this presentation out in the bottom right-hand corner, is a hyperlink that will take you out to the Pennsylvania Department of Education website. Um, if you Google this heading, the Public Health Guidance for Phase Reopening of Schools, it will take you to the website that I'll be referencing and summarizing. So a few key points um, that, that, that the department shared is that we have to continue to monitor the spread and implement strong mitigation strategies um, such as remote learning. Um, all plans must include the order of the Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Health on the universal face coverings. Um, again, we have to include for all pre-K to 12 settings, uh, include strategies that limit the number of individuals in classrooms and other learning spaces, maintain a distance of six feet from other adults to the maximum extent possible, and then require parents and caregivers to perform a symptom screening at home. Again, this is all coming from the Department of Education and Department of Health. With regards to busing and transportation, they're requiring bus drivers and passengers to wear masks when, or face coverings um, on a bus. Just for clarity, it could be a mask, it could be a face shield. We're looking to assign student seats moving from the back of the bus towards the front of the bus. We will be surveying parents um, about plans to use district transportation. And this is one of those suggestions from the department that we survey parents about their desire to use district transportation. And then upon entry to our schools, where in the past we may have had students going to cafeterias to pick up breakfast and to do other things uh, in the secondary schools, there is some socialization. The recommendation is send them directly to a room upon their entry into our school. Desks, alternate spaces, and hallways. Um, the recommendation provided to us in the guidance is to seat students six feet apart, facing the same direction to the maximum extent feasible. Separate students within common areas, hallways, gymnasiums, auditoriums, um, large group instruction room, media center, all of those, those spaces. And then create one-way patterns in hallways and provide floor markings. Uh, Dr. Hotchkiss, I do have a question, uh, actually two from this slide. <clears throat> the first one being, um, to the maximum extent feasible, does that mean that people can be less than six feet apart? Uh, yes, yes, they, they can, can be, be less than six, six feet, feet apart, apart, but in, but in that, that situation, situation masks, masks would be required 100% of the time based, based on the order. order. So, so that, 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 is that is the difference. difference. Okay, and then about hallways. If the hallways are wide enough to accommodate six, if you will, egress and ingress uh, that are still six feet apart, do they have to be one way? I guess, I guess to, to adhere to the, to the guidance, guidance provided, provided to us, which, which states, states create, create one-way one patterns in hallways, um, we, should we should try to create one-way one patterns in hallways. And I know in some of our buildings and, and uh, our principals, principals will share, you know, sometimes, sometimes that means students will have to go, uh, you know, to York Springs to get to East Berlin. Um, the whole idea is to mitigate um, crossing patterns to the greatest extent possible. So we will do everything we can in our buildings to adhere to the guideline of creating one-way patterns. Can I, can I ask two follow-up questions? So make sure you're I'm not muted. I, I think sure I, identify yourself too. I'm good. I did that before I raised my hand. Thank you. Um, regarding the mask wearing, it, um, so if they're six feet apart, they don't have to wear a mask. Is that what that I'm understanding? Correct. Keep it on. I will get to masks related to okay. adults and students later in the presentation, okay. specific to the guidance that's been provided to us as of last Thursday. Right. Now, uh, Dr. Hotchkiss, you're using the word recommendation and you're using the word guidance. Does that mean it is not a mandate? The title of the document yes. is Public Health Guidance for Phase Reopening. And there are instances where they make recommendations and there are instances where there are mandates. Okay. 
And how, how do you view that as the superintendent, if I may ask? Challenging. Dr. Hotchkiss, <laughs> there are yeah. two mics, both yours and Rich's, and it's echoing. I'm sorry. Challenging. Yeah. Meals in the cafeteria. Um, they're recommending the best option to serve meals and have students eat in an alternate setting. Here's a, here's a good example. It's a recommendation. However, if you do, if that, if you have limits and you do need to utilize the cafeteria, sit six feet apart, wear a face covering until students are seated. Um, we're in the arrangement in the cafeteria, we're trying, you have to stagger uh, the arrangement so that students are not sitting across the table from one another. Our goal is to serve individually plated meals and avoid sharing. And again, these are the recommendations um, and or requirements from the state. School staff and visitors. Face coverings must be worn by all non-student visitors and staff while on school property. Um, however, that uh, they have to wear them unless they have a medical condition or mental health condition as outlined by ADA. And then we would make an exception for the mandate to wear a face covering. Face coverings may be remo removed while eating or drinking and when in classrooms and six feet of social distancing can take place. So again, back to the earlier question, um, when we're able to be six feet apart, you can remove uh, masks. Staff are not required to wear a face covering when a face covering creates an unsafe situation. I'll give you an example. If we're in welding class, you, you, you would wear a welding helmet. You would not wear a face covering. You would wear that situation. And so, you know, I don't want to limit it to just that. So uh, that would be an implementation at the building level that if it creates an unsafe situation, you would not need to wear the mask or face covering. Students. All students must wear a face covering that covers their nose and mouth while they're inside and outside of the building. And when we cannot get six feet of still, uh, social distancing, it's not feasible. Number two, children two and over are required to wear a face covering unless they have a medical or mental health condition or a disability that's documented in accordance with section 504. This is new guidance that was just issued on Thursday. And I know uh, Ms. Say is going to address that from her end um, a little bit later on in the presentation. Schools may allow students to not wear face coverings when they're at least six feet in the following situations, eating or drinking, sitting at a desk, engaged in any activity. So just in general, if they're in an activity and they could be six feet apart, they would not have to have the face covering. Or when the covering creates, again, an unsafe situation, similar to what we had talked about in adults. The uh, guidance provided also hits these other areas. Based on the information there, I am not providing an overview of hygiene, cleaning, uh, chronic conditions, immunization. Those could be found out on the website because there are kind of nuances. But for our purposes, um, what I just shared previously, um, I thought were really important uh, components that the health and safety team took into consideration when making our recommendation. And certainly um, just, again, feedback from uh, parents, staff, community. So what now? Here we are, 22nd, where we're hoping to have a uh, approve the health and safety plan and approve a new calendar. And again, tomorrow we wanna email, survey to families and gather some really important information. I will share with you that on the survey, we, we need 100% completion. So we'll give a, a time period um, we're looking from July 23rd to August 2nd, which is a Sunday. From those families we don't hear from, we will be calling because it's important that we're accountable for every single student and family and understanding, um, you know, their desire for instruction for the 2021 school year and other, other uh, needs that they may have. So again, communication, just want to share out, we'll be emailing um, that information tomorrow. I'll also be placing a phone call at the same time. Uh, I will also utilize the text messaging feature that says, hey, please check your email for a very um, uh, an important message. And we will post information on the website. So if you recall last week, um, here's, here's the process that our committee has going through. We were considering three options, all face-to-face, -face, then a hybrid K-6, to uh, 
uh, or face to face K to six hybrid seven to 12 option three 100% remote learning and then certainly um, for those that would choose to not uh, come in person, we certainly want uh, to offer Eagles Academy um, as our cyber option. So this was prior to the governor's executive order about face coverings. Following that, we modified um, our approach in that now we felt like we needed to consider two options, 100% remote learning and then a K-12 hybrid instruction. And again, this was based on feedback from community and, and clearly uh, masks and face coverings is a, is a big issue. And so the feedback was consistent and that was inconsistent. You had a large group who said no, a large group who said absolutely, and everything in between. And so we took that into consideration when making a recommendation. And we know that it is a, a topic that people feel very passionate about. And we heard from all sides on the issue. So then following the, the uh, Department of Health and PDE guidance, the committee is recommending option two, which is a K to 12 um, hybrid approach. We're calling it cherry and steel for school colors and also Eagles Academy. All of this with the caveat that we're recommending uh, a school start date of August 24th. So now the next few slides, I'm gonna to explain to you what the hybrid approach would look like. First, we would group students based on last names. The cherry group would be student last names A through L, the steel group M through Z. I will tell you, the committee seriously considered alternating last names based on the grade level. So with a few tweaks, we could have almost hit the 50% mark. However, we didn't bring that recommendation forward. We didn't wanna confuse people by varying the last name by grade level. I want you to know though, our building principals put in a tremendous amount of effort to look at the number of people, to look at the, the, the true numbers. And we just felt for, for our purposes um, and to make sure that people had accurate information, um, we're recommending A through L, M through Z. So there are some exceptions to the group. We recognize that there are students who live in the same household, differing last names that may cause them to go to a different group. We will obviously group them together. We're we'll also recognizing childcare. So if childcare is an issue and we need to make uh, you know, an exception to be partnered with somebody because of childcare, we will work through that individual situation. And then obviously we're not naive enough to think there are some extenuating circumstances that we will hear the story of, of folks. And all of these exceptions will be made at the building level as we work through to understand uh, the needs of our families. Under this new plan, students will attend school face-to-face -face every other day. This is different than what we shared last week based on feedback. So week one, the Cherry Group will attend school on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And there is an asterisk on Friday for a reason, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. The Steel Group will attend school on Tuesday, Thursday. The days in between will be virtual learning days for those students. So yes, our teachers, uh, at one time, we'll be instructing students face-to-face, -face, but also providing remote support for our learners at home. And so it's challenging. And so we're, we're trying to work out exactly what that may look like. Um, planning periods that we have for teachers will look a little bit different. Uh, but again, that is the recommendation. So then a week two would look like the groups would flip. The Cherry group would go Tuesday, Thursday. The Steel group would attend school on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're also... Um, learning support, emotional support, and English language learners must attend on their assigned group day, but we are offering face-to-face -face instruction five days a week for those students, okay? Those are, those are an exception that we're making. Adams County Technical Institute, what used to be known as Tech Prep, is now ACTI. Those students must attend ACTI five days a week for their programming. However, um, the requirement for Bermuda and Springs is to attend class at the high school on their assigned day. So it's five weeks or five days a week at ACTI, but then it would be three or two days in person here. This is Matt Nelson. Does the tech prep have their own safety plan? Is that something then that Rich and Dave? Yes. yes. All right. And so we've been working and, and one of the nice things about ACTI is they have a lot of space. 
And so that helps. They've got a lot of space, but kid, they, they can really do some tremendous social distancing, be safe in their facility. And so uh, they are working on a plan and we'll be putting forth a, a plan to be approved by their board. And that part hasn't happened yet necessarily? It's happening as we speak. Oh, okay, awesome. Richard, I can't there. <laughs> so why the asterisk for a Friday? So again, we, we recognize and heard from a lot of people um, about just our original plan, which was every other day with a flex day. And we were talking a flex day on a, on a Friday, which was a, a full day um, where students would be just two days per week. And so we tried to make some accommodations to address a lot of different things. And this to me, I wanna tell you, is a very creative approach that I'm super proud of our team to think differently, to really try to check a lot of boxes to meet needs. And I think this um, does that to the best of our ability. So the asterisk for a Friday, for, uh, the group that attends school on a Friday, it will be a half day K to 12. So keep in mind one week, it'll be a cherry group. The next week, it'll be the steel group on a Friday. And we're making that a half day with secondary dismissal at 1115, elementary dismissal at 1215. We will be providing lunch for those students um, as they leave the building. That's what we've done in the past on half days. So for families of students that are scheduled to attend school on their designated Friday, depending upon the cherry and steel, we will be offering after school care for students in grades K to six. We recognize if those students are in person and then they're going home midday, childcare in that half day scenario could be more challenging than trying to find a whole day. So we'll be offering after school care. Those students will be supervised by adults. K to four students can remain in the elementary school until 3.30. Grade five and six students can remain in school until 2.30. So again, we will be working through that at the building level so that we know who's going to stay. We will make accommodations for those particular students. As a part of that, we'll be offering what we're calling Eagle Outreach, which is bus transportation to designated locations within our community. If you remember, we used to have the old late bus runs and we also would have the summer literacy camp runs. And so essentially we divided the community in half and we, uh, sent buses out to make large loop to drop off students in centralized locations. And so the idea here is that we would be doing the same thing at 2.30 for our grade five and six students, then the buses would come back and we would do the same thing for our elementary students at 3.30. And again, it's not a door to door. It won't be their typical bus stop, but it'll be general locations throughout the community. Again, as a way to try to meet the needs of our families um, and our students. However, if folks um, just or, or, are able to come and pick up their children at the end of the day, they just need a few other hours um, to, for us to watch their, their students. Anybody or the designated person, K to four, would pick up their child at 3.30 and grade five and six, we would pick up at 2.30. So why a half day? One, this allows for a deeper time to clean our buildings. And so if you think about the AB that's happened throughout the week. Um, we're cleaning half a day on Friday. We will be able to uh, deeply clean our buildings and then have them sitting idle for two days over the course of a weekend. We also will be able to provide additional time for teachers to plan and collaborate on content uh, with their colleagues. That's really important because keep in mind, we're now gonna be asking teachers to work with students in person and provide assistance to students remotely. It's a large task. Um, I know our teachers will rise to the challenge, but it's asking a lot. So we really were looking for a way, because again, we heard from our teachers about their challenges. So we were looking for a creative way to try to provide them additional time to support students, create content, in addition to what their planning time would be through the course of the week. And so the third uh, uh, check mark, this also is an opportunity to tutor students, to work in small groups, Teachers can organize all of that. Now we've got time at the end of that day, should the need arise, we can have some specialists who set up meetings for students. Now we've got that time built into each, um, each week uh, to support students. And I will share, that doesn't necessarily have to be just with the students who are working remote on that day. It would be open to any student. It also provides us an opportunity for parent meetings um, 
in the plan and the details of the plan, we will make every effort to make accommodations and provide remote access for meetings. Um, however, um, in the event that we just really can't do that or make that accommodation, now we've got time set aside um, on those Fridays that we can have meetings as we uh, deem appropriate. So Eagles Academy, this is the same slide um, as last week. And again, this is the Bermudian Springs Cyber Program. It is a comprehensive K-12 program that's standards align. And I wanna make sure that I share, um, there, there are some folks um, who reached out to ask about Eagles Academy. The 2021 school year will be actually year two that we've offered uh, K to six access to Eagles Academy. And I can tell you um, when I first came to Bermudian Springs in the spring of 2008, shortly thereafter, um, I got on board and started our own Eagles Academy and was the manager of that program. At the time, we kept it at the secondary level, nine through 12. As the content became much higher quality, we added grades seven and eight. But I will share with you, the reason we did not go K to six is because I did not feel at the time that we had really good quality content that was applicable to elementary students to meet their needs and to meet family needs. So we, we held off for a number of years from going to the K to six offering at K to six. Now there are some new partnerships with the, the vendor. We use the capital area intermediate unit. Um, we feel really good about the quality of content, the platform, the structure for um, the K to six program. And um, like I said, last year was our first year. I believe it was highly successful. We use our own teachers. We use our own mentors to support students. Um, and I believe our students had a really good experience um, and we feel really good about the quality of the content in Eagles Academy. Um, new, we will be taking over the technology um, support and maintenance. Now I will tell you, there's a transition. Um, so some of our students that were in Eagles Academy last year will keep their laptop that they had um, for, with the Capital Intermediate Unit. And so any new student who registers um, we're uh, sharing that we're going to be providing an iPad and a Bluetooth keyboard. Um, however, if they have a desire for a laptop, we can also provide that. However, as you know, many, many people across the country and the world are trying to get access to technology. So we placed an order for uh, Chromebooks. And the last I heard, we will not get them in hand until November. And so we're really trying to come up with ways to support the technology with Eagles Academy. I feel very confident that we can do that. Um, I do know that we have iPads um, available, can be used even for students five through 12, they have iPads. We will provide a Bluetooth keyboard um, for them to access content. And at the end of the day, um, students uh, that enter in Eagles Academy and graduate will earn a Bermudian Springs diploma. And then finally, just a reminder of the cost. We spend nearly a million dollars on our cyber charter schools. Um, we just certified the other day the new tuition that we will have to pay cyber charters, and it did go up slightly. We're about $11,200 for a regular ed student, and we're about $21,150 or so dollars for a special education student. And so it's important that if people um, are looking at an alternate placement other than the hybrid that we really would like you to um, go to Eagles Academy. And part of the information that goes out tomorrow, we do have a video from um, our instructor who oversees Holly Wallen, see, oversees the program and she put together a summary of, of more details about what Eagles Academy is. So people will be able to click on that access and learn more about Eagles Academy. And then just a reminder, um, we have to be flexible and adaptable. Things change so often, so quickly. Um, and you saw that last week. We had a draft plan on Wednesday. New guidance came out on Thursday that was quite significant for us. Um, so we are trying to create an infrastructure that is flexible and nimble, that can adapt to any of these environments. So one of the questions that we, that we received was, hey, are, are we able to change our approach once the school year starts? And the answer is yes. If things get better, we're slowly going to look to bring students back more often face-to-face. -face. If things get worse, We'll have to go to the other end, possibly to full remote. And so as a district, our teachers, we are working now on the digital content um, through the creation of courses in Canvas, um, our learning management system through Seesaw, uh, to ensure that we have content that is digitally available that then could be adapted to the amount of face-to-face -face that we have and could be used. 
but our, our teachers are working really, really hard um, on their content. So that's the end of my presentation and recommendation for um, our opening of schools for the um, 2021 school year. And now um, Brooke Say, district solicitor, is going to um, share her lens from the solicitor standpoint. And uh, I'll just turn it over to Brooke. Oh, sure. Shane, this is Matt Nelson. I just had a question. You mentioned before with the hybrid day, I thought it might be important maybe if you could um, give an illustration of what the teacher day looks like, because they're if it's half and half. So you mentioned, you know, they're going to have half their students in front of them that they're going to be instructing. And that's more like a typical normal day in the past. Is your mic on? It is. Okay. Um, so the students are in front of them for half a day and their other half their students are at home that they also need to provide remote. So I know the students have assignments they can work on, but how can they support those? Illustrate kind of how the day works. Like how are they going to be able to talk to the students in front of them and also support the students that are at home? So um, one, um, I was an elementary teacher, elementary principal for a long time, um, reading specialist. And one of the things that always has stood out to me in that environment is was our ability to work with small groups of students. And um, many, many teachers would tell you, if I just had a smaller group of students, I can do such a better job. And so our approach um, creates that. We're looking at the elementary level of having class sizes anywhere from 10 to 12 students. And so our ability to provide meaningful quality instruction to students will be the greatest that it's ever been in that environment. I believe that we'll, we will be able to get deeper into content and make better connections and understand the needs of our students because we're going to have a lot less of students in front of us. I believe uh, we'll also be able to provide at the, at the earliest levels guided reading, which is the foundation of everything that happens for the student's education. Under this setting, we can do so um, safely. We're six feet away. Students would be not have to wear a mask. We can provide that. And so um, good quality teaching is some type of direct instruction, you know, laying out the foundation, making connections to previous learning, okay? And then at some point you're providing guided practice and then students are gonna have to go to independent practice. And so I can envision teachers while students are working independently, checking the email for a student who may have a question coming in because that would be the means of communicating. You might be able to email, you know, one student with, with something, um, to answer their question. I can see that happening throughout the day. We also um, know that teachers will have a, a dedicated planning period. So in the past, they may have been planning content or making copies, but what we're really gonna ask to do is look first to see which students need to you need to provide support. We will also ask teachers to communicate with their classes when their planning period is so that they know that there's a time that they'll be able to tap in to get uh, some assistance. We will also be looking, we have other adults in the building. So we'll be looking to leverage other adults who could provide supports for students in that remote learning setting. I don't know quite what that looks like, but I know that we have adults and we can leverage them a little bit differently. So I can envision us um, using, using those staff members to support students who may have questions at home. Um, and then, you know, and then finally, um, we have to be adaptable. And so uh, you know, I'm going to trust our teachers. We have talented teachers and we're going to ask them for, for what it may look like for them. You know, I don't want to lock and create this edict as a school district that we say, this is how you have to do it. We're open to suggestions. What the ultimate goal is we just want to provide support for as many students for as much of a time as we can. But it also, again, that Friday time provides the ultimate opportunity if, if a teacher notices that student A and B and C are falling behind, they could create a small group on a Friday and specifically meet with those students in the afternoon, whether it's uh, using uh, re you know, remote instruction. Um, so we think that that's really important. And that, that could be any student that they've seen through the course of the week. That would happen in a typical classroom. You pull students aside, it could be flashcards, whether it's um, you know, math facts, vocabulary words, um, or just have a conversation about the importance of, of comprehension. And I noticed that you're not using context clues. So all of those types of things can happen during, during that structure. That's how I envision. So I guess I'll turn it over to Dr. Fox if he has anything in addition from the, from the instructional, instructional lens. Hi, John Fox. Um, at this I point, point instructionally, it, it will, will provide, provide a chance to preview on certain activities, certain activities at home as well. We'll provide the chance to preview certain activities at home 
um, prior to coming into the class. So that previewing is a really central and, and important aspect for, uh, for some students also. And then it, it does give that extension activity um, at home also for students to be able to um, extend and refine um, the skills um, and knowledge that they um, had from their teacher in the classroom. Um, this is Matt Nelson again. The, so the difference, there won't be necessary, I, I, I love, I agree with the idea of not making that structure then too, but so then each classroom then to each teacher then will be responsible kind of to say like on your days when you're not in class, I'm, I'll be available 12 to one or something like that during the day. Um, I guess that was the question. Is that kind of what you're, that's kind of the yes. scenario that you're, that you're laying out? Yes. And, and, and listen, there are other times through, depending upon what the schedules end up, there could be other small pockets of time. And what we're going to ask is just communicate times throughout the day that a teacher may be available to provide support because it's going to be different for everybody about what that looks like. So sometimes it could be a window in the morning. Um, it could be a window at the end of the day. Um, Listen, we'll never ask um, teachers to give up lunch. They're entitled to, you know, be able to eat. Um, but certainly, you know, I, I know our staff and I know teachers are going to go to great lengths to try to support. So it also is another opportunity. Dr. Hodgkiss, um, how's this work for the, um, like the art classes, music, you know, those, those teachers, does, what effect does that have um, as far as like Fridays for them? Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So at the elementary level, it's a little little easier to handle. And what we've talked about at the secondary level, middle school, high school, is we're going to have to be creative in what the day looks like. And so that's still in the development. I know that there's some ideas out there of, of what the school day can look like, because what won't work is every Friday under the half day, you can only go periods one through four, because you're going to miss the remainder of your day. And so we're really trying to figure out how, how can we creatively meet the needs of students, providing them access to all content areas? The other piece under this, it's, it's written in detail in the plan, is that under, like in an art class, you know, we want to try to vary activities by grade level so students aren't sharing materials. And we're going to try to limit that. We're also reaching out, we're purchasing additional materials so that students can have their own materials to be able to, to use in those classes. In the event that we can't um, uh, provide our own, we will have to um, clean uh, materials in between. For instance, I used earlier, if we need a, a few students to weld, we're gonna have to wipe off the welder um, in between people using the welder because of the nature of that equipment. The, the other, other, the other piece, piece we're working through are band and chorus. The national associations have put out um, guidance on what that looks like. And the reality, uh, you know, 30 students in a classroom singing and projecting, um, you know, the spit just can't happen. And so we're looking at uh, creative ways to provide music instruction for students. And our, our, our department is working on that right now. And we have some very creative people. Students will still go to, to music class. They'll still go to band class. Um, for instance, we're in the auditorium. You know, we have the flexibility uh, to bring some students in for a course in the auditorium and be able to, to be a part um, and be able to do a little bit of singing potentially. So we're working through those particular areas as well. Um, Dr. Hodgkiss, I have a question. Um, this is Jen Zerfing. I was wondering what, I remember the last time we talked about the hybrid model, we talked about students coming Monday, Tuesday, and then a different group coming Thursday, Friday. And so I'm curious as to the, the reasoning of why, I'm, I'm just thinking for myself as a parent, it's, it's fairly complex to have different schedules for my kids from week to week. Um, as far as arranging for daycare and things like that, or if I need, if I would need to ask off work, it would be easier to say, oh, I need off work every Tuesday and, and Thursday. But to say to an employer, for example, I need off work this week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and this week, Tuesday, Thursday is complicated. I'm sure you have a good reason. I just am curious what that is. Yeah, great question. And uh, um, it's definitely something we thought about. Somebody you know, brought it up today. And um, one of the things, when you look at the district calendar and you look at holidays, a lot of holidays fall on a Monday. And so through the course of the calendar, if students were assigned a Monday, you would have the same students missing the same day all the time. And so whatever group was assigned to Monday would miss more school clearly than any other group by far by the nature of holidays in the calendar. So that definitely was one situation um, that played into it. We also 
started, you know, talking about just daycares and, and, you know, would that make a difference for people? And, and here's, here's what we believe is that daycares are gonna be impacted by other school districts and their calendars as well. So trying to make this accommodation to, to say that daycare X is gonna be open on, we'll have room on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but not Monday, Wednesday, Friday, is really contingent upon somebody else that we really can't control. And so what I will share with you, if that message starts coming out really loud that, hey, to go Monday, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, we can certainly look at that. However, um, I could give you numbers, but if you look at the calendar, we miss a lot of Mondays. So there definitely would be a group that would not be face-to-face -face equally as the other group because of the way the school calendar falls. And the other, thank you, I understand. Um, the other question I had is, um, I, I, as I understand it, it seems that fully face-to-face -face is off the table. And, it, and so now we're deciding between a hybrid model of K to 12 or a remote model. And um, I appreciate that the hybrid model seems to be a compromise between those two extremes. Um, when I think about it, it reminds me of if I have to choose between wearing black dress shoes to work or brown dress shoes to work, the worst thing I could do is wear one black one and one brown one. So sometimes the compromise isn't the best answer. My question to you, Dr. Hotchkiss, would it make you uncomfortable if we as a board decided to just start the year remotely for a, a determinate amount of weeks that we would have to decide upon as some, I've noticed a lot of schools are kind of kicking the ball down the road. It gives the teachers some certainty up front and it gives us a chance to see what's gonna go on around us in, as other counties choose to open up fully? Great question. And so what I'll say um, here's procedurally, our, our committee is making the recommendation to you um, for the K-12 hybrid approach. At the end of the day, um, through the health and safety plan, you will make the motion and make the recommendation, whether you agree with the administrator and the committee's recommendation, that is completely up to this board. So I just want you to, to know that. I also know that regardless of the decision that you all make later today, we have an administrative team and a team of teachers that are, that are going to put all, they're all in. They're going to make every effort to do the best we can, regardless of the model. And so whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable, I just know we're going to work relentlessly to make whatever model you all end up approving to the to, to, to be the best educational experience for our students. Here's where, why we landed on the K to 12 hybrid approach, okay? First, we would all love to be face-to-face. -face. Nobody signed up for this, none of us. We want kids here. Kids are emailing us, we wanna be here, which is great. And we'll remind them of that at some point, um, which is really great. But we're also, I'm gonna go back to the mask issue. We also, we're face covering. We have a lot of people who, simply don't want kids to be sitting all day in classes wearing it. And then we have other people who say, you should be sitting in class all day wearing it. So we feel that the best opportunity that we can create, and again, with the goal of maximizing face-to-face -face was one of our goals from, from day one is hybrid because we can create an environment in a classroom where students can be more than six feet apart and would not have to sit there wearing their mask all day. However, they are more than welcome to wear their mask all day. It creates choice. Face-to-face -face does not create that choice. There's the exceptions, by the way, the exceptions I talked about. So when we listened to the feedback, and it was everything that I've just described, that's why we landed on the hybrid, because it gave a choice to the people who feel passionately one way. Here's the, here's the reality. We don't have a choice, and, and, and Ms. Say is going to talk about that in a little while, to take the liberty of not requiring masks and face shields the way it's been outlined to us. And she'll talk about that in, in a little while. So that's, that's the reason that we got to the recommendation. But I will, I will tell you, we have an amazing team of people. And it's not just, it's staff, all staff, support staff, administrators, teachers, you all. We're going to do everything that we can do to make wherever we land the best educational experience for everybody. 
Thank you, Dr. Hotchkiss. I appreciate that. This is Jen Zerfing again. Um, I just have one more question and um, I'm wondering, um, I haven't seen a whole lot of um, details about the of remote opening, but um, when I think of fully remote, there's two ways I think of it. One is that everybody absolutely doesn't come in the building and the buildings are just, you know, silent and dark. Um, but in my mind, I see a remote option being where um, everybody, quote unquote, goes remote, but then we start pulling people back in the building. For example, um, you had um, delineated the special education, um, ELL learners. And so supposing besides that tier of learners, supposing we had our building administrators identify um, high need categories, because I believe there are some children in our district who would really just, they just need to be here Monday through Friday. They just need to be. And if we had our administrators develop criteria such as uh, economic need, you know, if, if you're a single mom and you just cannot afford daycare so that you can work so that your child can be remote, then why can't those children be brought in? And we can have our paraprofessionals oversee those because then you're talking about maybe 20% of our district or maybe 30%. So you have the social distancing, the people who absolutely need to be here face to face aren't stuck being here every other day. They're able to be here every day. And then people who are, uh, you know, who don't have that need are able. And so everybody would be able to get the same education and the teachers would only have to, to plan for the remote education because we'd be able to deliver that education to everybody. I'm going to ask Dr. Fox, because like I said, we, we have been planning for full remote because we believe that the, we can access the content and we can apply it to a face-to-face -face setting. Um, we also believe, and we've shared that, you know, in the spring, we had 10 days to turn things around. That, that wouldn't happen in the event we had to go full remote. And certainly if that was the desire of the board now, the planning would, would, would continue what we're really doing and we would do some different things. So I'm gonna have Dr. Fox um, kind of share and answer some of your questions about um, what 100% remote learning would look like. Thank you, uh, John Fox. Um, enhanced remote learning, we've learned a lot of lessons from the spring uh, 2020. Um, going enhanced remote learning, we would provide um, more synchronous um, or live same time teaching demonstrations and class meetings uh, using a video platform, whether that be uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Um, it would look different at the high school, middle school, uh, once per six day cycle possibly, and at the elementary school, um, it would be either in the afternoon or morning scheduled with parents. And please know that a lot of these recommendations from our enhanced uh, remote learning um, guidelines were created by a lot of the pillar work that was done uh, by teachers that we started in early April. We would use more video and audio um, that the teachers are creating and they're working on those teacher created audio and video right now by placing those in uh, Canvas and Seesaw. I'm unmuted. Other, other, um, other considerations um, for our enhanced remote learning uh, include, of course, grading. Uh, we will ensure that grading um, occurs during the 2020-2021 uh, school year. Grades will be located in Sapphire as well as attendance will be taken. Um, the Canvas Parent app will be available that uh, parents will have the uh, chance to use that app uh, to be able to pair and uh, look into um, what the course looks like for their students. We will make sure, and we're uh, regardless of being hybrid or being enhanced remote learning, that there will be a more consistent experience in Canvas for students, as well as the utilization of a single platform, which will be Seesaw um, at the elementary school level. And if we went enhanced uh, remote learning, we would make sure that uh, we provided uh, some clubs virtually um, 
and again, really trying to emphasize that, that, that socialization that's needed and that social aspect, the best that we can provide. Thank you. So at this time, I'll uh, turn the floor over to uh, Ms. Brooks Say, our school district solicitor. Ms. Say. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I wish I could be in person. Um, just so you can get a full picture, I am wearing a dress that matches the cherry red slides you have provided me. So. Um, I want to introduce myself to the public who's listening. Um, I am the school solicitor attending your board meetings along with uh, seven members of my team that practice in school law. Um, it has been basically our 100% job for the last 20 plus weeks of assisting school districts with COVID-19 and now with the reopening plan. Um, and I want to provide a special welcome to the new school board member um, Ms. Milner, we're excited to have you and just to applaud the board for working through cohesively that appointment. Um, it's another example of the commitment of this school board and district um, to working together for the best interests of everyone. Uh, it's a particularly difficult time for schools. And so I also want to thank you as a board and administration for the work that you're doing uh, to focus on reopening and the problem solving you're doing. None of it is comfortable. It is not something any of us have done before. Um, and one of my jobs as your solicitor is over the past 20 plus weeks to have guided you folks, our clients, um, in how to interpret all the different things that are coming at us um, and helping at some point to be practical in implementing all of the guidance we receive. Um, so you'll see there on sort of my introductory slide that one of my primary jobs is to help you dig through that guidance and then balance it with the practical realities of a school and then defend you when someone comes back to criticize you on why you made the decisions that you made. And you can move to the next slide. So one of the questions I often get, um, especially from superintendents and sometimes from school board members, is you know what do I do with all of the guidance that I'm receiving? Um, if you ask a, a, a school superintendent, they'll tell you they're getting hundreds of emails a day. Uh, they're getting hundreds of pages of guidance to read. And there's a lot of people and authorities and uh, institutions that have opinions on COVID-19 and school reopening. And so I wanted to make really clear to the board and to the public um, sort of how to dissect through those various authorities and, and sort of rank them and prioritize them. Um, and I think this is important because people have a variety of opinions about what guidance we've received and what mandates we've received. But I want you to understand why Dr. Hotchkiss and his team make the decisions they make. Uh, they're aware of this hierarchy. And so when they make decisions, there are things that they, they don't particularly have much of a choice on. And so they're gonna to try to navigate those mandates and apply them as practically as they can in the school setting to maximize what you guys have asked them to do, which is educate students. And so I want you to think about that. In the slide in front of you, you have what I consider the mandatory authority uh, or authorities, the guidance that we receive. And it's gonna come from the governor um, and his form of executive orders, which apply essentially to all citizens and can apply specifically to schools. You're going to receive specific guidance from the Department of Health, which again covers all of us through Dr. Levine, um, her orders and her guidance. A most particular example of that would be the mask or face uh, shield wearing order that we received as a Commonwealth, which guides you um, in your everyday life as a public citizen and also guides um, our, our actions as a school district, a public school district receiving public funds. We have our own specific Department of Education, which, um, gosh, it seems like every two weeks uh, sends us a new piece of guidance, which completely disrupts our world. Um, it's their job to give us that guidance, and it's their job to sort of, sort of navigate this before us. Um, and things are changing by the minute, by the hour, by the day, by the week. Um, and within the Department of Education, we have some specialty bureaus. One of those is the Bureau of Special Education, and that's going to give us guidance um, and mandates relative to our obligations under federal and state law for students with disabilities. 
all of the other sort of laws that are in place when we're not in school closures and COVID-19 and, and reopenings, those are all still there. The public school code uh, does tell us a lot of what we do in the everyday. Um, an important thing that's probably on your agenda tonight is it tells us how we count a school day, um, how we determine how a school day in remote instruction actually counts towards the 180 day requirement, the 990 hour requirement. So things like that are all still in play, um, even if uh, we're completely distracted by other guidance that we're getting. And finally, um, if your local county had a Department of Health, that local Department of Health does have some level of authority over citizens and school districts within that jurisdiction. So I'm gonna pause right there and see if there are any questions before we move to the next slide. Okay. So is there other guidance that we pay attention to that may not be listed as what I would say mandatory uh, authority? So there's persuasive authority. Uh, we all know and hear about the guidance uh, from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. And you all know that when you look at Department of Health orders and guidance coming from our Pennsylvania DOH, there is often a citation to the CDC. So that means that our Department of Health can decide we're gonna adopt the guidance of the CDC. Um, so CDC is strongly influential in our decisions as schools. In some circumstances, it's absolutely a mandate because our Department of Health or the Department of Education or various other individuals that have authority over school districts have adopted the guidance of the CDC and therefore we are adhering to those standards. The American Academy for of Pediatrics is a strong influence. They have over various months weighed in um, on uh, you know, various things relating to students attending school and protecting students with disabilities and how to ensure um, a safe and sanitary experience for students. And that's another organization that we pay attention to, but they like every other organization have certainly morphed and changed their, their positions and opinions um, on school attendance. What I'll call common guidance is some other things that are floating out there. The WHO, the World Health Organization has put out some guidance, um, but just like the CDC, unless adopted by our own state, um, they're not binding on us, but they are a common guidance or could be influential on us. And the same thing relative to other county departments of health. Uh, for example, Bucks County uh, and their school districts, they have a department of health, so they issued their own guidance um, and many school districts in the state were paying attention to that. However, that's not binding guidance on us. Um, it's not mandatory guidance for us. And if there is more specific guidance from an authority that is mandatory for us, for example, our Department of Education or a directive coming from the Department of Health, we have to adhere to that guidance over these other common guidances or persuasive authority. Any questions on that slide? Okay, so I wanna focus on what guidance of all the things we've heard over four months is really controlling the decision-making that you as a school district have today. What is on your agenda and the recommendations of your administration. And I think there are three really big ones. And in about a week or two weeks, we could have a whole new set of things we're paying attention to. But I think these three are going to remain really prevalent. And the first is, as you know, the mandate for you as a school board to approve a health and safety plan and for that plan to be uploaded to PDE, not approved by PDE, but uploaded to PDE and placed on your website and your responsibility to, if you tweak that plan, to continue to update that on your website and to notify PDE. That requirement has been in place uh, since June of this year. And that requirement of passing a health and safety plan is essentially required. That is a mandate. You must pass that before you can begin any in-person instruction. So regardless of what model you use, if that model includes any form of in-person instruction, this health and safety plan must be passed prior to starting uh, that instruction. So keep that in mind. The second really controlling factor that's motivating a lot of our decision making now is what uh, Dr. Hotchkiss has referred to as Dr. Levine or the Department of Health's mask or that executive order, that 
Specifically, the next day after issued was designated as applied to schools and school districts and students. And then there was accompanying Pennsylvania Department of Education guidance. It's called the face covering order guidance that was issued by PDE in sort of a frequently asked questions uh, sort of format, identifying what the obligations of school districts are relative to that mask order. And, um, and I'll just reiterate, that is an order. It's an order that applies to citizens of the Commonwealth in their responsibilities as private citizens. And it absolutely applies to the activities of a public school district. It is one of those things that is not guidance. It is not simply persuasive. It is a mandate. Um, and if you wanna think about sort of the why of all of this, um, the mask order is an order. And your health and safety plan is required to have compliance with the mask order. And your health and safety plan must be completed, voted on, and submitted to PDE before in-person instruction actually takes place. So you're going to hear me say this later. Regardless of your opinion about wearing masks, the why, how, if, the politics of this, that, and the other thing, the mask is the entry point to beginning in-person instruction of any sort. If you don't have mask compliance with the order in your health and safety plan, then you can't begin in-person instruction. The third most guiding uh, piece of information right now, controlling, is PDE's public health guidance. That's how it's um, entitled for phase reopening. Uh, in there, if you dig through each section, probably five pages long and there might be 10 various sections, you will see public health guidance as it relates to schools. It refers to things like the mask order. And there are sections that talk about what's mandatory and what is simply a should. So if you want to figure out what is an absolute mandate and what is not, you want to look at that public health guidance, you want to look at the mask order, and you want to look at the health and safety plan guidance that was put out by the state because within that document there are sections that are starred as mandatory and there are sections that are not mandatory so that is how our authorities have communicated to us um, and it makes very clear there is no leeway on the masking and as a result of the masking order it has essentially controlled the manner of instruction that we would do in person uh, and has essentially placed some limitations on the number of students we can actually have in person for instruction um, without wearing a mask. Are there any questions on these three critical precedents? Okay, slide four or five. What are some of the most significant mandated elements for reopening? We already covered the health and safety plan. We already covered the mask mandate. Um, and Dr. Hotchkiss covered pretty extensively the modifications to instruction, transportation, things like meal service. Um, but I wanna reiterate um, a, few, a few things relative to the final bullet point and then some just general comments, flexibility and planning. Um, I think one of the most significant mandated elements is the ability to be flexible. PDE, is requiring you to meet the days and the hours of instruction for the school year. And that means there is no time to waste. That means you have to be prepared for some form of school closure. You have to be prepared to potentially go to online instruction in full or perhaps in part, um, because that requirement for instructional time is not being lifted. And so that mandate is weighing heavily on all of us. I like to say, you know, there were complaints about instruction in the spring. Uh, we did our best with zero notice to provide instruction to students remotely. This fall, our obligation is to get it right. Uh, we've had some time to plan, uh, not as much as we would like, um, but the goal is that those days count. And so we need to be able to pivot at a moment's notice and have plan for lots of different options because we don't know what the future holds. On the health and safety plan, I just wanna offer this other um, important note. Our health and safety plan, which permits us once, once uh, filed and uploaded uh, to begin in-person instruction, 
is entitled to health and safety plan because the health of all teachers, staff, students is the highest priority. You will note that in that plan, the majority of it is not about how you're going to provide instruction. It's about sanitization, safety, uh, how you're going to address exposure, how you're going to reduce risk. Um, it's probably one of the most and the least quote unquote educational documents you'll ever receive from PDE because it is so highly focused on the health of all um, down to, you know, what a building might be doing for ventilation. And the result of that is, I think it's fair to say that these requirements, these mandates and this plan modifies the policies and protocols for almost everything we do in schools. On the masks, I want to just make very clear that masks, according to the order from the state, are the rule, they are not the exception. And as I explained earlier, masks are essentially critical for you as a school district to resume any form of in-person instruction, no matter how great or how little. So whether you're a believer in masks, spiritually, scientifically, politically, they are kind of a ticket to entry as designated by PDE. PDE indicates that to begin the in-person instruction, you have to have the health and safety plan. The order requires that the mask requirement be part of the plan. Therefore, if you want to think of it as a simple equation, masks get us back into school. There are specific exceptions that can be relied on. As I said, masks are the rule. It's not the exception, but there are exceptions that, that can be relied upon, but they are absolutely predicated on a documented disability and what we often call either the ADA process with our employees or a section 504 process with our students. Um, masks, not wearing a mask uh, is considered a disability-based accommodation. It is, and I know this is gonna be very unpopular with some folks, it is not simply a personal preference. Masks are the rule. Uh, they are not the exception unless it is a disability-based accommodation. And that is very clear under the order. However, there's a bright side, uh, and I think this is one of the things you're attempting to achieve with your hybrid opportunity. If you are able to achieve the six feet distance, masks can be removed inside and outside. The order strongly encourages mask breaks. Uh, and I think uh, our Secretary of Education has since, gosh, uh, June, maybe even earlier than that, May, been strongly encouraging a hybrid approach because I believe he understood the difficulty of building in the six feet distance that I think PDE ultimately needed to achieve with school districts. Um, there are exceptions there for breaks, there are exceptions for permitting social distancing um, and inputting that. And when masks are unsafe for the activity, for example, student athletes are not gonna be performing their workouts um, or their scrimmages wearing masks. So there are exceptions there, and we intend to make individualized determinations for individuals with disabilities who cannot wear a mask. And there are lots of reasonable accommodations we can make, even for our own employees um, who have that same sort of disability concern. We can provide face shields, and we can provide opportunities for other reasonable accommodations. Um, but masks are here to stay, and I don't anticipate that's going to be changing anytime soon. And just finally, a brief note on flexibility and planning. Um, there are some huge elements that your administration, my law firm, and the Department of Ed have not stated or told you what's going to happen. For example, we don't have a closure protocol. We don't have a specific plan for contact tracing. And guess what? The Department of Education and your State Department of Health have not provided guidance yet to the school district on when and how they might have to close because of people becoming sick. We don't have specific guidance on how contact tracing is going to occur through the Department of Health. So when Dr. Hotchkiss has a confirmed case in the school district, he's to call up to the Department of Health and one of their staff nurses is, is going to give guidance. But we don't know what any of that guidance looks like. If you look at the three pieces of information um, that I reviewed here, the health and safety plan guidance, um, the public health guidance and the mask order, you will see it is very clear. Um, while there are some preliminary procedures in place relative to contact tracing and what to do if someone is sick, we don't have a protocol. We don't know when closures are going to be forced upon us. 
Um, we do know that the priority of the Pennsylvania Department of Education and this school district is that just because one student is sick or one staff person is sick, that we're not closing an entire building. I think PDE is recognizing that if it was just one individual um, that we would have closures rolling throughout a school district and throughout the state. So they are attempting to find some sort of reasonable middle ground uh, and we don't know what that looks like. So I just strongly encourage this district and every district to continue with that message that Dr. Hotchkiss has ringing in your ears about flexibility and planning for the inevitable. Um, that's going to be one of the best ways that you can get more comfortable um, with the uncomfortable. You can move to the next slide. Okay, so how can a school, oh, can you go back? I'm sorry. How can a school district manage concerns with liability? This is probably the most common question that I get. Um, I have sat through a number of board meetings that talk about health and safety plans and the biggest question I often get is, well, what can the school district do? Should they, should they have people sign waivers to come back to school? You know, what if we don't do things perfectly? How do we manage all of this risk? And, uh, and how do we manage it if we decide to have some form of in-person instruction? And so the best way I can answer that as a lawyer is to say there are two critical features um, that contribute to a successful reopening for any form of in-person instruction in a school district. And that is an equal contribution of personal responsibility for every person who sets foot on a district campus and school responsibility in adhering to the mandates to a reasonable degree. And I'll explain those starting with the school responsibility. We have mandates, we know we have to meet them and we've come up with our best way of implementing those in the school district. Then we have guidance, which tells us, this is what we want you to meet. This is a should, not a must, it's a should. Um, and my guidance to school districts is to try to meet those should standards and that guidance to a reasonable degree that you're able to do it. Not going crazy, insane, not spending more money than you have and can't afford and, and not doing things that are gonna in other ways impact the goals of the school district, but your efforts in attempting compliance with the guidance of the, of the institutions that we feel um, have mandatory authority over you demonstrates non-negligence, demonstrates compliance with requirements, then demonstrates that you're being a reasonable school district and attempting to provide the safest, most sanitary and productive educational setting for students. Um, and, and that's critical. That is the school's responsibility. We always talk about as lawyers, the negligence standard. And that often talks about did, did the reasonable man or woman, you know, take what they, what they knew and act reasonably with the information that they had to adhere to what is considered uh, the reasonable standard, the reasonable uh, school district actions. And so here we try to meet those standards. We are trying to be compliant. We are creating a plan that we think we can implement. We are attempting to meet the guidance that is in front of us. And you're consulting with lawyers and educators and contractors to get that right. But we are only as successful if we are met from the personal responsibility side. That means every citizen showing up whether they agree, disagree with the mask mandate, doing their part to sort of enable school in-person instruction to occur to a certain extent. And that means coming to school, recognizing that things aren't gonna be the same, but that you know, as a school district, our goal is absolutely to adhere to the mandates and create an educational setting where everybody can learn. And that's gonna be complicated, um, but if people can show up with that personal responsibility in mind, um, I think it will make the school responsibility and, and any potential liability down the road so much less um, because we are trying to comply and there's a lot of things to keep track of and things are changing daily. Um, but if those two factors are in play, I think the school district has more than adequately managed concerns with liability and risk. There is no scenario of in-person instruction that eliminates all risk of COVID. That's an impossibility, um, but it is all about being flexible, balancing the risk and proceeding with the information um, that you have to open safely. Last slide. So just a quick review, um, because I get, a lot, I get a lot of questions about what people hear and how they interpret guidance, and I wanna make sure I cover that. So 
Which of the following rumors are true? There are no exceptions to the mask wearing requirement in the indoor setting. And that is absolutely false. As I said before, there are exceptions. Um, they are not simple exceptions. They are not just, I don't want to wear a mask, um, but they require an individualized determination. And furthermore, um, if you are able to achieve the six feet of social distance, which it sounds like is gonna be very feasible in the plan that you're proposing, there are lots of opportunities for individuals to remove their mask. And of course, also maintain their masks if that's, if that's what they wanna do. Number two, people who refuse to wear a mask or refuse to permit their student to wear a mask can do so for any reason and they don't have to tell anyone the reason. And that is quite simply false. Um, you can read that in the order, you can read that in the PDE guidance, um, and you can anticipate if you're the public or a staff person listening here that the school district wants to work with you on these concerns. Um, but there's an order that we have to comply with, and there are some exceptions that are permitted, and we're going to try to create an environment where everyone has an opportunity to take off their mask. That's the great opportunity that comes with a hybrid plan. So uh, third, there is no formal plan for contact tracing in schools. Well, as of now, that is kind of true-ish. Um, we are waiting to see how much more specific our Department of Health can be. Um, and we know that we're gonna be making contacts with the Department of Health if there are uh, COVID cases in your schools, um, but we don't know the details of that yet. Um, that is another area where your administration is gonna be getting additional guidance um, and we're just gonna have to wait and be patient. And that's not comfortable, but that's where we are. Finally, just a quick reference here. Uh, is this rumor true? The CDC requirements for a return to school or work after contact with a confirmed probable suspected case do not apply to schools. And that is quite simply false. If you look at the very end of the guidance, the public health guidance that was issued by PDE, you will see that essentially PDE and our Department of Health here in Pennsylvania have adopted CDC's updated requirements. Um, a student or a teacher cannot simply return to school or work um, because they have a doctor's note indicating that they had COVID but they don't have it any longer or they were symptomatic um, and they, you know, they, they are now no longer symptomatic and can return to school. There are very specific requirements there um, relating to different types of either students or, or, or staff, um, depending on what the nature of the concern is. For a student or staff person who is not believed to be exposed, but had symptoms, there's now a provision for um, permitting them to return to school work um, if they are 24 hours without a fever and fever reducing medication and they are symptom free. That is something new. That's something a little bit more flexible. But for students who are exposed or staff uh, who had close contact with someone who had the virus, anything that we call probable confirmed cases, the CDC rules are really stringent. Um, and this is one reason why I I'm happy to see that you're getting very comfortable um, with a hybrid plan. Either you're gonna have that in place now or you're ready to have it in place whenever you need to um, because there are gonna be students and teachers um, who are absolutely going to be required to quarantine for 14 days. Um, they're not gonna be able to just come back to school after two days. There are gonna be people who are exposed, people who have the virus, and uh, there are gonna be large gaps of time in their work and their education. Um, and we have to comply with our Department of Health um, adherence to those CDC requirements. So those are just a few little review of what I've heard as sort of rumors. Um, and I wanna pause there, I know this is a lot, um, but I want to take questions and I, I want to say, feel comfortable, push back with me, ask the question that's on your mind. My job here is to make you more comfortable with the advice that you probably don't want to hear. Hey, thanks, Brooke. This is Jen Zerfing. I have a quick question about the um, travel. I, I, I'm going to call it a ban for lack of a better word, but my understanding is that if you go to one of the hot spots, like one of the states um, that's on the list, you, when you come back to Pennsylvania, are encouraged to quarantine for 14 days. What, what's the legality of that? Does that mean like if a teacher goes on vacation and you, the week before school, they, they have to quarantine or no? Well, that's a very unique question, considering that I am currently under a 14-day quarantine for visiting four states in an RV that are currently on that list. 
So I am not permitted to return to my workplace. I was even going there only one day a week. I, by virtue of my firm's instruction, I'm not permitted to attend your board meeting. So that is, uh, it's not listed as a mandate, but that is the recommendation of the governor. Um, and so what we have told school districts is they need to, to establish a definitive rule relative to that 14 day um, period. I'm not going to give my explicit legal advice on this one because Dr. Hotchkiss and I haven't talked about it. Um, but I will say this, um, many districts are implementing the 14 day requirement. That's going to require a significant amount of notice to teachers that might have to make changes to their plans. Um, or might have to work from home for a period of time. And that's gonna cause a great amount of disruption. Um, we don't know how long those bans will last and we don't know if they'll be in place in August. Um, but a number of school districts I think have publicly stated that they are imposing that upon their staff members, um, but not every school district has come out and said that. So that's something that Dr. Hotchkiss and I talk about and I can provide him an explicit recommendation uh, that's not here in a public forum so we can maintain attorney-client privilege. Um, but that is not listed as a current mandate, but that is a strong consideration um, for, I would say, PR purposes, for safety purposes, and a lot of other purposes that you might consider um, relative to the exposure of your staff and students. Brooke, Dave, Dave Reinecker, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we uh, take attendance in school on the off days of this hybrid uh, model and, and how that's done and how that might carry over to your last question that was asked about quarantining yourself. Um, I'm thinking students, not staff at this point, but quarantining yourself after returning from the ocean or, or a weekend getaway to a state um, that is on the list? Yeah, so um, the, the name of the game with attendance for this coming school year is flexibility. Um, if you look at the public health guidance, um, they are absolutely sort of confirming that there are gonna be what they call attendance challenges. I think it's gonna be more than a challenge. I think it's gonna be hurdles that we're gonna be confronting. And, and there's gonna to have to be flexibility. However, it's not gonna be the kind of flexibility we had in the spring um, because our instructional hours are counting. And uh, we want students to have the opportunity to actually attend, even if they're not sick, um, and, and have those days count as attendance for them. So um, you have a lot of flexibility relative to attendance. However, our legal advice is that you, you have some form of attendance for this coming school year um, for students who are attending virtual instruction. And you have a lot of flexibility on how this is determined. That could be by logging on, completion of assignments, and you would need to consider a lot of the individual circumstances of students. Um, but the, the mandate is that there is attendance. The mandate is that there are students who are gonna be prohibited from coming to school because of a need to quarantine. And um, there's going to have to be options for them to participate educationally um, if, if their parents don't make a decision to cancel things like trips and vacations out of town or if they're required to, to quarantine for periods of time. So um, leniency and absenteeism is, is strongly encouraged, but at the same time, accountability in attendance is going to be really critical um, for virtual instruction. And so we're going to be discussing that um, in our regular conference calls with their clients. It's not at the point yet where we're going to be officially changing attendance policies in board policy, but you can absolutely be assured that the administrative regulation part of that is going to be changing for the school year. Um, did I answer your question? And I think the administration might have an answer on that too. So yeah, I'll, I'll just remind everyone and the board that we are one of 80 school districts of Pennsylvania that have flexible instructional days. As part of that plan, we had to create criteria for taking attendance. And so our plan would be to utilize the same process that has already been approved by the department to take attendance. And it really comes down to um, work completion. So when we use the FID day on February 14th, that's how we counted attendance for that day. So we would use something similar uh, in this case, I think it's also important that we're just touching base with students every day, somehow, some way. And so that would be our methodology for calculating attendance. Um, even in the event if a student is quarantined and they're, they're away for uh, multiple days, now you can see the importance 
of having digital content available um, because we believe that they can still access their work. We can check in with them and we can mark them in attendance based on what that work completion and assignments would look like. Can I, uh, Rich Stern, I would like to ask a, a question of Brooke and even Dr. Hodgkins. So uh, let, let's pretend that I'm a, a history teacher here at Bermudian Springs. And uh, for whatever reason, I have to quarantine for 14 days or two teaching weeks. So I can be at home and I feel fine. So, uh, so I, could, I could be doing remote learning from home and the kids could still be coming in in a hybrid model. And but you would still have to have, you wouldn't even have to have a certified person in that room. You could just have somebody sitting there reading the book, making sure that the kids aren't killing themselves in that room, right? <laughs> Yes, yes, maybe not, not quite, quite to that, that level, level, but yes, I, yeah, you, but you understand. I, I understand what you're saying. And, and there's a perfect example. That I, I'm highly concerned about staff availability, substitutes. Substitutes on a typical year are a challenge. And to, and to me now, it's even going to be a greater challenge. So if we have self-quarantine um, that has to happen, how are we covering classrooms? So you, you just shared one of the creative ways that, that we may be able to, to meet that need. And that's um, every one of our classrooms has a projector. We can video stream in the teacher if they physically can't be there, have adults in the rooms supervising. Now I'll tell you, I don't think I want that for kindergarten. You know, I, I, we, we have to be sensible with that. I do think it could apply to other areas. Um, that, that's, a, that's a huge challenge that not just Bermudian Springs, but every school district is gonna have to try to, try to figure out. Um, and, and I know that talking with our building administrators who are here by the way, so if there are questions at the building level, they certainly can, can try to address those as well. It's a concern they have. It's a challenge that we have. And the reality is, is we, we don't have an answer other than if you're listening and, and you have the ability to be a guest teacher or substitute, please, please reach out to um, the substitute teacher service and um, get yourself uh, you know, there um, ready to go. So, because we know that we're gonna need substitutes and it, it's a big deal, but um, that's a great you know, idea that folks are, are contemplating to be able to meet the demands of students if somebody has to, to take that quarantine. It, this is Rich Sterner again. It takes me one extra step to get to get on. Um, I, you know, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife texted me and said, don't, stop, don't sound stupid when you talk today, right? Um, <laughs> Rich, Dave Ronnie, until you get until your, you thought, your thought, back. thought back. Okay, go ahead. On that, on that uh, uh, Shane, the, the, the substitutes, have you, have you given, given any, any thought, thought to, to, or the district thought on hiring, and I'm going to throw a number out there, three 180-day substitutes, long-term substitutes for Bermudian district in a classroom to be determined but knowing that our need is going to probably exceed that from time to time, but at least it would give us three. They could be assigned jobs in tutoring. Uh, Jen brought up about giving students more one-to-one -one tutoring opportunities. And if those substitutes didn't have a classroom that particular day or a teacher's schedule to fill in for, that they could tutor some of these areas that may need some extra instruction. Um, but at least we would have a set number. Uh, and, and the difference in pay between a day-to-day -day sub and a long-term sub would keep them loyal. The other thing it would do is those subs would not be going to another school, picking up the COVID-19 and bringing it back to Bermudian Springs. For this year, they would be Bermudian Springs long-term subs, loyal, and we would ask them to please don't visit other schools um, to take that chance of bringing it back into our buildings. No, that's the end of my question. There's a bunch, bunch of questions, of questions. there.
So that is not something that we have considered just in general of having substitutes available. Because one, we recognize there's a financial commitment there um, to hire for this year, three long-term substitutes. That's probably about $150,000 hit or more. Um, is that about right, uh, Justin? Yeah, minus, minus the cost. Because you would have, with that 180 times three, it's 540 days at whatever the day-to-day -day sub is. So you've got 54,000 coming off of that that you would use for day-to-day -day subs anyway. You, you are correct. The day-to-day -day -day rate is $105 a day. Long-term sub is a prorated salary. Dave, so, that is the difference. so to get back to your original question, it is not something that we have talked about or considered now. But again, once we understand the direction um, and what is approved, we have so many different things to implement and consider. And, and so I appreciate bringing it up and it's definitely something that we will keep in mind um, because we do know that we're going to need help. We also know that we may have some availability of other staff members, our certified teachers that we may have to use them differently. And so we just wanna be mindful and financially responsible, um, you know, and thinking through that, but it's certainly something that, that we definitely will consider. And, and should we believe that it's imperative to be able to open up schools, we'll be coming to you guys asking for permission to make such a move. I, re I remembered my question. Um, my thought was that if, if a teacher is not here but can still do remote learning, you wouldn't necessarily need, need a certified sub in that room. And that you could have like a teacher aid sub even because I'm sure you have teacher aid subs that sub for teacher aids that are normally in class, which that's what I was thinking about. We do, and they're, and they're limited. And, and right. obviously the number of aids available by building is, is wildly different. We have more instructional aids at the elementary school. Right. And as we go up through the buildings, we just have less of those type of support positions. Well, another thought too, I'm sure that you have teachers that are compromised uh, for like uh, immune difficulties, diabetes, teachers that might be more susceptible to, to COVID that might be coming to you with, with major concerns that might be able to teach remotely. And I'm just thinking out loud right now. Sure. sure, and we, we recognize that we're actually in the process right now of gathering all of that information. And again, you heard Ms. Say talk about, um, and I mentioned about working through the ADA and making accommodations. And so we're active in that process. I don't have a number for you, or if we have staff members who, who meet a certain criteria that, that we're able to be in a situation where accommodation could be remote. Um, we, we, just don't, we just don't have what that looks like, but we're, in, we're actively gathering that information now and working through on a case-by-case -case basis with each staff member. And that includes, by the way, that includes support staff, all employees were working through that same process. Dr. Hodgkiss, um, I have a question. You said we could ask the administrators. And one of the, while we're talking about subs, it made me think about teach, filling teaching positions even. I know um, the one that comes to mind, I think Mrs. Myers, you posted a math position, am I correct? And I just wondered, have you noticed uh, increase or decline in the amount of applications you get for a position as compared to what you would typically would get? This is uh, Shannon Myers uh, responding to Jen Zerfing's question. I, I've only had one position currently to fill this summer, um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that, so I don't know, actually Mrs. Ely's had positions to fill this summer as well. Um, the math, certified math, secondary math positions are difficult to fill as it is. I know that Mr. Defoe had a position and struggled to have a number of applicants as well. So I can't say that that's COVID. I think it's just more of a difficult position to find applicants for. Um, so for right now, I can't say that, that this situation would be a reason that we're continuing to wait for applicants. Do you, either of you want to add? Uh, I would just say that's been the same in math. I mean, prior, John Defoe, uh, prior to the COVID, the last two math positions we've had, we, were, we had five and six applicants. So that's, that wasn't COVID related. 
I think the big thing is across the state, when you look, the number of teaching certificates being issued is dramatically reduced over the last five to 10 years. I know, I think it was the ag position when we contacted the state, and don't quote me on this, but I think they issued like 17 certs across the state of Pennsylvania and that, that year we did the interviews. And this is Jenny Ely. I would just kind of mimic what the two other administrators had said. I'm not sure. I can't necessarily pinpoint COVID or just maybe a teacher shortage within the area to see the decrease in applications. Anyone else have any questions? At least at this point, there will be another opportunity later on in the agenda where we could you're able to have a discussion should you think of something in between or have any questions for Ms. Say regarding her presentation. Dr. Hotchis, I do have a, another question. It might be helpful to have attorney say um, on the line because I don't know what the details are, but um, now that we're seeing that we actually do have to enforce mask compliance for in-person learning, my question, and again, I'm asking you to look in your crystal ball, um, how much time and resources do you anticipate will have to be spent just on mask and social distancing and hygiene compliance with students? And it may be different across buildings, I realize that. Well, I'll say this, and I said this the last time when you asked me to look in that same crystal ball, so I'm still looking at that. and and. and Miss Say, you know, hit on it previously. Um, matter of fact, I'll go here. It's a personal responsibility now. This is what I believe that I've heard. Our community wants our kids in school. So in order to keep our kids in school, wear the mask. Unless you've got some situation that you can't. That's, that's my ask. And so if we do that, um, we won't have to spend the amount of time to work through people who just don't want to wear the mask. Okay, I, I get it. Um, right now, the way I look at it is, it, it's just not a choice. And so it's my hope that, you know, our community, you know, recognizes that, that they, they wanna have kids in school in order for us to be able to accomplish that, we just have to do our part. And so I also am being real and, and we'll, we'll, there, there will be situations. And all of those times where we'll have our administrative team working through with each student and each family, you know, takes away from our ability to be supporting kids instructionally or guiding them or speaking with them about an issue that they have or, or, or you know, doing, doing something, um, you know, to, to guide them. And so I don't have a number. I do think that we'll have some. I'm just asking and imploring everybody, please don't put us in the position. You know, we, we, and again, nobody signed up for this. We don't, we really don't want to have to spend our time, you know, from a disciplinary standpoint. But I'll tell you, if, if individuals and families and students have a, have a, they believe a reason that they should be exempt from wearing a mask, have the conversation with us. You saw the guys, we'll work through that with you. I will, I will promise you that that will happen. And so, um, I, our, our, our administrators and our teachers have a tremendous amount of responsibility already. They have a, you've, you've, you've heard the plan. There's a tremendous amount of work. And I'm just asking the community, just work with us so that we can spend our time providing an outstanding educational experience for our kids to the best of our ability. And we focus on that. You know, I, I think the last 20 weeks or however many weeks it's been that, you, you know, Things in life just look a little bit different. Priorities are a little bit different. I think we've gained perspective. And I'll go back to when I'm getting emails from students to say, I want to be in school. I love that. We, we want them here in school. We all do. Our community does. And so part of that is that personal responsibility to just do what we need to do so that can happen. And I got to be honest with you. I hope that everybody does that so we can continue to add days that everybody's back so we can get to a point that we're here five days a week. Learning could look different, but you know what? It, I think it's made us appreciate just, you know, the opportunity to touch kids, build relationships, you know, make a difference in their lives and provide them opportunities and experiences. And so, so again, that crystal ball, I, I don't know. I'm just asking that we try to, you know, just keep it to a minimum and we don't have the, you know, the, the battle over something that truly is out of our hands. 
Um, that, that's my ask. Well, thanks. This is Jen Surfing again. I appreciate uh, that answer. And, and that does sound great um, people to have personal responsibility. Um, I, I would, I'm trying to, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of stakeholders, uh, with parents, with teachers, with students. I've been trying to listen. I think we all have had a lot of conversations with a lot of people. Um, and, and I'm just trying to think back to those conversations and some of the people who um, talked about the different options. I wonder if, if some of the people who would normally say that, that they like the hybrid option because at least they get some in person. I wonder how many of those people would say, but if I have to wear a mask, I'd rather do fully remote. And I don't have the answer to that. It's just one more thing to think about. So I'll just hit on and remind you again, the recommendation for the hybrid, we believe creates situations in classrooms that students will not have to wear a mask. That's the recommendation. We can, we can accomplish six feet in classrooms. We've measured in our elementary classrooms, we can fit 11 to 10 to 12 desks easily with guided reading. And even in our, our uh, high school and our, our middle school classrooms, we have enough space that students would not have to be sitting there all day in masks. That's why we've made that recommendation. So to me, it was our team's compromise and taking everything that you've just said and all the perspectives we were hearing, that's why we landed where we landed because of, of that issue and trying to just do the best we can to represent all people. Anything else? Shane. I have, a, I have a question. This is Matt Nelson. Did we, I, at one point, we talked about feedback from the teachers. Do we have input or, I know teachers were on some of the committees, but what was the overall feedback that we received from our teachers on what plan they prefer? Yes, yeah, so the, um, the teachers, we sent out a survey for staff and collected information, and then our teachers did uh, some things on their own as well. And, um, you know, a lot of concerns, a lot of, hey, if, um, if I, if, I'm a suspected or have it, what's the process for me? And so we're planning in the very, very near future um, to have a session with our staff to explain the types of leave, what that looks like for them and process through a lot of those, those questions. Um, you know, part of that was, and the, and the return rate on the survey was about 95%, okay? And the return rate was really high and um, it was, 70% of the staff that took the survey chose remote learning as their number one choice. But again, just wanna remind everybody, that's one perspective. And that's, I think that's that important, I, I hear what our staff is saying, okay? I hear what our community is saying. And so that's where at some point, you know, we're taking this all in and it's, it's all over the place. And so what's, what's been great, people have been so respectful in, in getting here, here's what we think and, and understand the back and forth and just know that for every person that, that we have on one side, we're getting equal the amount of people on the other side. And so I just give you that perspective. Um, and and I, I, I know our, our staff, you know, recognizes that, but I think it's important for the community to understand that it's, it's, it's the big picture of everybody. And, the, and the, we said it, and I'll say it again, nothing you all decide is gonna please everybody. We recognize nothing we recommend is gonna please everybody. We all want to, it's just truly not possible. And so our recommendation, we believe is the best recommendation to meet as many needs as we can and accomplish face-to-face, -face, which, which was one of our goal, the maximum extent possible and provide, you know, just a rich educational experience for kids. That's why we're giving you the recommendation we are. Um, Dr. Hotchkiss, this is Jen Zerfing yet again. I'm gonna put my parent hat on for a minute and imagine, you know, sending my kids into the classroom. And I love our teachers. We have amazing teachers. Um, and I'm wondering, you said 70% prefer fully remote. And so if, so that means that there's, you know, it's, it's more likely than not that the, my children's teachers will be in a situation where they may put on a brave face, 
but they feel uncomfortable. Um, and so as a parent, I, I, I just hate to put a teacher in that position. That's all my two cents. I hear what you're saying. I just want to, you know, just remind you, our, our teachers are amazing and they've done great things. And I know that whatever, wherever we land, they're going to do the best they can. Um, and, and, and I think that that's important to just remember that, that I don't think you're going to have staff regardless of that 70% who's not going to put forth the effort to do the absolute best that they can. I think that that's important. That everybody hears that regardless of where that landed in the same way with our administrative team and our planning team, we're going to do that. One, because we're passionate about kids. That's why we're here. That doesn't change because of a pandemic, but it's what does it look like to provide that same support, to build the same relationships, to provide the same enrichment activities. And that's where we've been pretty creative, but I, I know our staff is gonna do everything that they can to, to just meet the needs of kids and help one another. So it, this is Jen Durfing again. Sounds like to me then that you feel that the remote option is far inferior to the hybrid option? Well, it's inferior because it doesn't meet our goal of trying to meet face-to-face -face with students. And the reality is um, we believe that that's powerful. We're a public school. We believe the relationships that you can create with face-to-face -face with people can't be matched in any remote setting. Whether you're a, a full cyber charter school, your Eagles Academy, you're our remote learning. That doesn't mean that we're not going to try, but you just can't replicate being in front of people, seeing their expressions live, being able to react to body language, you know, being able to do all of those things. That you just can't, you just can't replicate, you know, through the computer. We've all experienced that. You know, even now when you wear a mask, you know, we all have to tell everybody, I'm smiling with my eyes. Because you all smile, everybody smiles when you're underneath of it. You say hello, people just can't see it. And so, you know, when you're face to face, if we're with we're with our students and we have that safe social distancing, students are going to see the smiles. They're going to see the interactions. They're going to get that that experience. Dr. Hodgkiss, did uh, the the employee survey go out? Uh, Miss Say, you have anything to add in closing? Yeah. Did the survey to the staff go out uh, prior to the mask order being in place? And do you think now that masks are required, it has any impact on how teachers view returning to work in person? Good question. The survey went out prior, maybe even the day of the, the PDE and the DOH guidance. But I can tell you, um, prior to even our conversation, we were waiting to, to get the guidance to see if the order and what was posted was in fact accurate and what it meant for us. So since then, I have not communicated with the staff. This would be their first opportunity to see that in fact, this is the requirement. I would make the assumption that it may be different based on that, um, but the timing was off by, by truly a day or so um, in the guides. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hodgkiss and, and Ms. A. We uh, appreciate the information. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Uh, old business, we have none. Um, discussion, well, we certainly have had some of that already, <laughs> which is all good. <laughs> so is, um, is there any, anything else we wanna discuss prior to the uh, moving to the new business? Okay. New business, um, item A, we have uh, so our personnel items. Um, one, uh, some resignations. Corey Trosel moved to approve one A, B, and C. I have a motion, do I have a second? Ms. Griffey, second the motion. Okay, I have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Aye. Item aye. two, uh, sabbatical aye. request. Jen Zerfing, I move to approve. Rich Stern, second. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? 
Mike, I have, I have some questions. Can you explain? Uh, I think in, in Mrs. Dietz's letter, she explained that. You can't talk about that. Well, can't she at least explain the, how, what's the guidelines for getting a sabbatical? Was there reasons to approve it, not to approve it? Sure, sure. I, I believe the, the letter is uh, public record as part of the attachments. And um, so in the collective bargaining agreement that's outlined, um, who is eligible for a sabbatical and the reasons, and uh, Ms. Dietz has met those requirements, she would be eligible for an educational sabbatical. And what she's indicated in her letter, in the event, and this goes back to Mr. Sterner's recommendation earlier, in the event that a full remote learning or remote teaching opportunity would become available, she would rescind her educational sabbatical and would want to be given, or she would be interested in the opportunity to go fully remote. So she's, she's looking, looking for flexibility, flexibility um, but she, she does meet all of the requirements outlined by the collective, collective bargaining agreement to be eligible for the educational sabbatical. Dr. Hotchkiss, this is Matt Nelson again. I just had one question. And if the fact that it made it to our agenda then means the district, if there was some reason that you would not be okay with it, that would be part of the discussion. The fact that it's on the agenda means that the district is putting it out for us to approve. That, that is correct. Yes. Okay. And just to make very clear, a sabbatical is a public school. Any further discussion? Brooks on. Yeah, just to make very clear for board members who are not familiar with sabbaticals, sabbaticals are a public school code entitlement. So if you meet uh, a requirement number of years in a school district, et cetera, you can take one of them every certain period of time. So along with what's in the CBA, it's also a product of what is simply offered to teachers by virtue of a certain term of service. Um, so it is, it is often not something that we do a whole lot in approving or disproving because you either meet the requirements or you don't. Similar to FMLA. Right, so, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any further discussion? Okay. Um, well, Mike, I'm sorry, I have one. If if for some reason we would go remote, then we would allow her to come back, if that is what she wanted. Yes, uh, based on the circumstances, I would talk with her and we would come back to you and we would take board actions to make an adjustment to that. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item three, um, Justin's contract. Corey tries a motion to approve. Richard Sterner, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear and may abstain. Motion carries. Item four, we have a uh, transfer. Ruth Griffey, motion to approve four. Second, Dave I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Item five, temporary employment of support staff. Jen Zerfing, move to approve. Corey Trussell, second. I have a motion and second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear it nay or abstain. Motion carries. Item six, support staff employment. Jen Zerfing, move to approve. Richard Sterner, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item seven, substitute nurse list. Ruth Griffey, motion to approve seven. Corey, Corey Treasurer, Treasurer, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussions? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear and they abstain. Motion carries. Item eight, extracurricular contracts. 
Ruth Griffey, motion to approve eight. Rich Turner, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. Please call the roll. Ruth Griffey? Yes. Douglas Knight? Yes. Amanda Milner? Yes. yes. Matthew Nelson? Yes. David Reinecker? Stay. Richard Sterner? Yes. Corey Trussell? Yes. Yes. Michael Wool? Abstain. Jennifer Zerping? Abstain. Six yes, three abstain. Motion carries. <laughs> Item nine, we have volunteer coaches. Bruce Griffey, coaches. motion to approve nine A through K. Richard Sterner, second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Nay. Dave Reinecker, abstain. Thank you. Motion carries. Item B, memorandum of understanding. Rich Turner, motion to approve. Dave Reinecker, second. I have a motion and second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion, unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Health and safety plan. Ruth Griffey, motion to approve health and safety plan. Okay, I have a motion, do I have a second? Are we allowed to make a, a different motion if we don't get a second or what happens? Yes, we can. Okay. Dave Reinecker, second. I have a motion and second. Further discussion? Like a, sorry, go ahead, Rich. You, you can go first. Well, I, I, I would, would um, I'm just, just going to ask, ask a question, question first. first. And, that, and that, that, that would be that, that if this motion, motion is approved by whatever, whatever number, that, that would, would we be revisiting, revisiting this plan, plan as appropriate, as appropriate, like, like every, every board, board meeting. And that, that the administration, the administration I'm assuming, I'm assuming would then be reporting, reporting to us as appropriately as, as often as possible regarding this plan and how we're, how we're doing. doing. Is that, is that, that, that yes, that, that is accurate. And, um, you know, evidence of that, that other school districts who approved the plan early on have brought back to the board and they've revised the plan based on the latest information. And that includes a change to their instructional model based on guidance, based, based on just factors that have happened in the school district. Um, and again, yeah, yeah, reminder, the reason, one of the reasons that we're bringing it to you today, our next meeting is not until August 11th voting meeting. And so we're trying to be uh, responsible in getting information out, collecting information, informing community so that we can make plans uh, for the fall. Uh, uh, Rich Turner, again. again. But, so, so if other, if other uh, uh, guidance, guidance uh, recommendations, uh, recommendations or mandates, or mandates come, down come down from the state, state would you would you be, would you be uh, willing, to willing to pass those, those on to us, us as you get those? Let us know, let us know how, how that might affect the plan and, and affect, affect uh, how, how that would impact, impact any, any of the things that we have, have talked about here, here today. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think the evidence, um, if you. All know, we had a special meeting um, that we held just to hear the plan. So in the event that there was some, something really, really significant, we, we would have to call a special meeting and come back together. And it could be just a, a single topic, uh, but that would definitely be something that we would do. Any other discussion? I think, Dr. Dr. Hawkins, this is Matt again. Uh, if um, 
I, I guess the, the plan would have to be then submitted again to Pennsylvania. Do we have to go back through that process? Does, does submitting it to the Department of Education implicate or affect our plan some way in the future? No, it's just, it really is. There's an email address. We just attach the plan to the email address and send it. Um, so anytime it's revised, we would do that. We'd have to we just update the, the draft on the website. If Rich Sterner again, if it's my understanding that you just have to submit it and they check it off. They don't review the plan. They just make sure that you've got one. I, I can't attest I can't to what they do with it once they get it. Our, our child and responsibility is to send it to them. Yeah. Well, they're going to get like 500 and so of these in the next couple of weeks. So I can't imagine. Yeah. Dr. Hodgkiss, I, I wanted to ask uh, one more question. I realized I forgot to ask. Um, if we implement that 14 day travel restriction, which it sounds like it's probably a good idea to do that. Um, but if we do that, um, I'm just wondering logistically, if we actually do this hybrid plan, that's assuming that the governor doesn't shut us down before we even open our doors or two weeks after we open our doors. Um, so if we go ahead with this maybe plan, then how will kids catch up when um, they're out for 14 days quarantined? How are they going to catch up when their teachers are already teaching in person classroom and supporting at home students in one day? You know, again, I think that that's the, I don't know that there's catching up. There's just accessing the content that's going to be available to them. And so that's one of the reasons why that we're asking everybody K to 12 to have content available, um, whether that's Seesaw, whether that's available for uh, in the LMS of Canvas, because it should still be accessible by any student at any time. And what I will say is that uh, we'll take every instance, um, you know, on its own merit. So if that means that we have to have, if we have uh, several students that are that are quarantining or they're not, we're not going to see them. We may have to have other staff members checking in with them. Other specialists have more time, more time more frequently than we would typically do to make, make sure that we're trying to meet their needs and can include, you know, some face to face. And so again, going back to, we're going to have to be adaptable. Um, I will say, um, I do know of a school district in our eye that implemented the 14 day ban. And it's going back, back to reconsider, not, not just making, making a sweeping, sweeping generalization, generalization, but making, you know, you know a series of questions that you would ask that person because, because um, in, in theory, theory somebody, somebody could still travel to a state and not have talked or been in close contact with anybody. That it doesn't mean that they necessarily will put themselves at risk. And so we want to be careful to make sweeping generalizations because they cross, cross the border. The border. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of personal example. Um, a, a route that I traveled to school, I could cut through Emmitsburg, Maryland. So if Maryland was on that list. I literally could cross through for three minutes. Um, I think we need to be reasonable and not make somebody quarantine by passing through a state. So that's why I want to be careful about just making the sweeping generalization. I want to be reasonable and what that would look like. And also recognize, um, and this is where I have to talk to a church say about what are we allowed to ask? What are we not allowed to ask? How do we, that to me could become a full-time job of somebody gathering, collecting, analyzing that information. So that's something that we will work through. Um, but I do know that districts first are realizing that, hey, there are people who talked about, you know, if they draw that hard, fast line, they could be without half the teaching staff, you know, come the first day of school. So it is something that we are going to have to work through. Again, if it was a mandate, it's a no-brainer. Now it's a recommendation, and so we have to we have to have some further conversations about that. Any other discussion? Okay, Doug, call the roll, please. Ruth Griffey. Yes. Douglas Knight. Yes. Amanda Milner. Yes. Matthew Nelson. Yes. David Ronecker. Yes. Richard Sterner. Yes. yes. But may I make a comment? No. No. no? Corey Trussell. <laughs> I'll talk after that. No. Michael Wool. Yes. Jennifer Zirkin. No. Seven yes, two no. May I, Mr. President, may I make a comment? Yes, you may. 
I want the administration to know that we're we're trusted, and not to make you not be able to sleep again, because I know you've had sleepless nights about this. But we're entrusting you with the lives of over two thousand people, and uh, uh, I can't imagine the pressure that 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 feels like. I can't imagine that. And I respect you for, for putting this all together. I respect you for answering these very difficult questions. And I appreciate what you're doing. And uh, I think I can speak for the whole board with this one. Even, even those of us that, that, that were thinking about voting no and maybe voted no, and for whatever reason, but we are at your service. Just wanted you to know that. Well, and I just, I, I appreciate that. And, and you know, the reality is a lot of people have helped as much as me. We've got a great team. We've had a lot of input. People have been asking tough questions. They, they put a lot of energy into it. So it's not, it's not just me. I'm the facilitator of some of that. I, I get that. Um, and I value the input of our team and I trust our team too. And so people have stepped up. You know, we talk a lot about distributed leadership and that is, you know, you make decisions in your area. And so we've had so many people step up to do that from our cabinet to even, even support staff doing that. So, so it really has been a tremendous team approach. Um, and that's how we'll solve the problems. That's how we're gonna overcome the obstacles. And that's how we're gonna implement the plan. I will be honest, we are stretched, but we're doing it and we're going to keep doing things to the best of our ability to implement the plan as you've approved. Thank you. Okay, moving, moving to item D, emergency and structural time provision. Uh, Rich Turner, I make a motion. I have a motion, do I have a second? Ruth Griffey, second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Item E, revising the calendar for the 2020-2021 school year. Ruth Griffey, motion to revise the calendar. Go ahead. Corey, Corey Trace will second. second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? No, Mike, I have a question. It's okay. Dr. Hotchkiss, this is Matt Nelson. Was there, um, can you talk about um, if there was any, or what's the likelihood that we could push the date back to another date, potentially after Labor Day or anything along those lines? Is that a potential possibility? Is it something that we can still consider? And what's the latest that we could consider that, and I guess maybe the reason I asked that question is it seems that maybe the idea of providing our faculty as much time as possible for to make more content and more ideas available I guess, yeah. What's the likelihood that all I need to happen? We want to consider it. So you as a board control the school calendar. It requires board approval. And so that can be changed at any time. And so if there's a desire to change it, you have to keep in mind it has to get a, at a voting meeting. And so, again, it's that fine line between providing people enough advanced notice of what the calendar is. And to give you an example, we as a board have worked years ago to approve the calendar in the fall before the previous school year because our community is saying, hey, let us know so we can plan trips and we can plan activities. And so keep that philosophy in mind. And so, yes, we've considered after Labor Day, we've considered after another week, and here we're, we're revising by just a few days, which does keep, by the way, graduation on the same day that it was. Um, and, and it really centered around our belief that we want to try to get as much instructional time in and face to face with students as possible. We know heading into the winter, it's typically flu season. And so if you look at you know higher education, you're seeing a shift of higher ed, just starting sooner to maximize that time. And, and you know, schools are, are actually shutting down face to face around Thanksgiving time. So the more that we would push it back, I believe that we're going to lose opportunities for face-to-face -face students. Again, I don't have to crystal the ball, but it certainly played, you know, played into that. An advantage, if you win later, later, after a later day, day, which was always great, great, is when we come back, as the latest that it could be, is other schools will be in place, in place we, we could see what, what happens out there with, with other individuals' plans. plans. But, but again, you know, under that scenario, we've lost several weeks of instruction with our students. And, and so, so, yeah, I, I do value, value um, 
our ability to provide you know time for our teachers. That's, that's why, why it was. And thank, thank you for the, the approving of the health and safety plan. That includes additional time for teachers to plan on Fridays. That didn't exist before. So I feel like that it's a that it's a compromise. But I'll come back to. And it's a theme. Anything is possible, and that you guys control that. So something would come up that it, I think you guys need to reconsider. We'll hold a special meeting, and the school calendar can certainly come into play. What I do know is that we put a lot of systems and processes in place, and we're still actively doing that to implement the plan now. But the reality, it it the further we get, like it takes time to be able to actually implement the plan and the processes, and so. We're setting, We're setting people, people up, up so once we start, start to get the feedback and the surveys, we can, we can put, put them into the appropriate system and begin, begin to implement. implement. And, and so, so um, a continued continue moving target, target is a continued moving target, and you have to change your face to, to get that. that. So, so um, but I'll, I'll say, say you control, control that. You, you can, can do it at any time for a voting special meeting. We believe, you know, we're trying to be cognizant of not asking for too much, but just enough. And so right now we're at we're five days of, of time with our staff before students would come back. Um, that, that, that's, that's the ask for that. Um, thank you, Dr. Hotchkiss. It, what it would be the latest in the summer that you would, would it be feasible if we wanted to move the date? Is there like a cutoff date? Like, you know, we don't want to do it the day before. You know, what's, how far into August would you think Definitely we could go? Definitely don't want to do it the day before. Um, I, I mean, for me, I, I'd love to have it by the end of the month. I mean, once, once you get to August, 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 so much has to happen in the month of August. I'm um, cognizant, even student registrations, you know, you know our, our, our folks, folks, we've got a system set up where people are registering. It's, it's a lot. lot. And so we're, we're, we're trying to gear up for the, you know, the mass that's coming in. Now, keep in mind, we must hear from almost 2,000 students. And, and be, be able, able to make adaptations for everyone based on what they select in their instructional approach. That's, That's important. important. We're, We're going to be calling. And, and, and so we, we have a lot. And again, you choose based on something that, 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 that we need to come back and reconsider something different. different. We're, We're going, going to adapt. Um, but we feel right, right now um, this is a pretty good compromise to provide the time for our staff to continue to work with one another, um, create content, collaborate with one another. Get get things up. Up. And by the way, they've been doing that this summer a lot. Um, and so now we're just providing some targeted time before school starts to do that. And then again, leveraging each Friday under the model that we have also provided this time. Any other discussion? Okay, this is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion, unless I hear a nair abstain. Motion carries. Um, item F, bank resolutions. I uh, need to make some changes to our bank. We need to make some changes to our bank resolutions for item F. Ken Surfing, move to. Oh, okay, so I'll second. Yeah. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Item G, uh, a tax refund. Matt Nelson, motion to approve. Corey Trosel, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion. Let's say here and nay or abstain. Motion carries. Item H, uh, school psychologist services agreement. Jen Zerfing, move to approve. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Rich Sterner, second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Any other business to be brought before the board? Yes, Ruth Griffey. Yeah. Um, it's 
probably, it's probably not other business. It's a, it's about, we were elected and those three hours of classes that we're supposed to take, Dr. Hotchkiss, did you find out anything? Are they gonna waive it till next year? Cause we could be locked down again and we won't get them in by the end of the year. Right, and so um, right now, um, there have been so many other things. I, I, I don't know that they've um, addressed our ability to provide that. And so we're still gonna keep asking. Um, and to be honest, if we get to the point, we, we will come up with before the, uh, the deadline that we will do it. We're hoping that there'll be some reasonable accommodations to push out the required board member training um, because there've been a number of, of reprieves on other mandates that we have. And we're hoping this becomes one of those lists to give us all flexibility. Thank you. And this was a new mandate this year for newly, I mean, reelected board members. That's correct. They never mandated it before. That's correct. Thank you. I do believe there are some. And the only, the only uh, thing I just want. Go ahead. I do believe some of those courses are available online. So the only thing I want to mention is um, if there is a need to pull, pull this board back together, whether it's because of modifications to the health and safety plan, the count, you need more time and we need to revisit the calendar. I, I think I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think it's okay to say, yeah, let's have a, let's, let's have a meeting and spend some quality time together to, uh, to get through this. So that, just so you know, you're not alone. We're, we're here. We've got your back and you know, we're going to, we're going to support you. Second, I just want to thank everyone on the board. Um, this has been the, probably the toughest decision I've ever had to make since I've been on the board. And uh, at the end of the day, no matter where everybody kind of stands on the issues, everybody, I, I know that everybody is doing what they believe is the best for the kids. And that's, you know, again, why we're here. Uh, so I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I appreciated the questions, the thoughtful discussion, and just the, the, the overall tone of our, of our conversations. So thank you. With no other business, I will call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>